All right. Hello, 14ers, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is May 19th, 2024. And as many of you know, I'm just messing with you. For any of you who have watched the, the last teaching, I told my wife I was going to do it. I couldn't resist. Many of you who may have watched the last teaching knew, uh, heard that I had to get a, a tooth extracted. And it's extracted. All is good. Pain was incredible for about an hour or two. But then all was good. So I thought I'd mess with you having a having a crazy lisp or something because my tooth was gone. But all is good. Just messing with you. Welcome back, brothers and sisters. Today we are going to have some fun. We are going to dig into some stuff and and just follow as the trail leads and and see how it evolves and see what else it brings in and see where we we go off path a little bit to to remind and then bring it back and then take it through to the end. But all of this is founded today on what I spoke about briefly in the last teaching as well, that uh, our brother um, Roy had asked probably two or three months ago, uh, just asked whether I would look into the, the sands of the sea, right? They would be as numerous as the sands of the sea. And so I made a little note of it, and I, I kept my little tabs open. I've got them all of them open today. We don't need all of them, but we are going through most of them today. And um, I did some studying on it, and, and I just kept going from there. And then today, I was as I was planning this out, even yesterday a little bit, um, I was thinking maybe I would just kind of do a – just a, a see how it goes. Like, where am I going to go? Maybe I'll go this way. I'll talk about this. I'll go over there. I'll Just a variety of things. And I sat down this afternoon and started going through this and putting it together and then just – just followed as the spirit led just continued to allow it to to progress through and it takes us from what it's really talking about as you see the where it's telling us and i'm going to be able to flat out prove it to you unequivocally what the timing is of this this multitude of the sand of the sea coming in and then we're going to continue on from there to see what happens who's the one that does it what it represents, where it is in Scripture, what we find even in the Apocryphas, what we find in ancient writings. We're going to see it's even in one piece um, when it talks about the teacher of righteousness, like that write-up I've shared with you guys in the past. Um, you're going to see it's absolutely Christ that does it, and you will absolutely understand who Christ is when he comes at the end, at mid-trib, at the, at the end of the sixth year of seals in relation to the, the great multitude rapture. And 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 events that progress from there and what's going to happen and it's so it's very exciting We're going to go down these this main road But we will veer off a little bit here and veer off there But then we'll come back and then we'll bring it through to the end. So it's gonna be a lot of fun It's exciting. It was fun putting it together and as always for anybody that's new or newer to the ministry I know people like to comment right off the bat because you know, they'll, as soon as they hear something, they'll say, well, wait a second, this is pretty crazy. This isn't making any sense. I promise you, if you take the time to just do this one simple thing that I ask, which is go to this playlist right here on YouTube and click on this one, the Revealed End Time Study Note Series, or go to ministryrevealed.com, which you can click from right here. This is ministryrevealed.com, the homepage. Go to the menu, click on Intro, and watch the first Four videos on this page you can do it there on YouTube as well this first one is a 22 minute intro of the next three it'll start to give you a little insight into what the next three videos are going to be about it'll really help warm you up as to what these little bits and pieces and and what it all explodes into as the revelation reveals itself the second video is the who the what we call who the gospels are speaking to what you're going to realize anybody that studied scripture and is in the gospels you will notice that out of the synoptic gospels of matthew mark and luke in particular the stories are often similar but sometimes they're actually very different and we've been told all of our lives that that is just perspective you know it's just a perspective so when christ was here it was this point of view here and it was another point of view there and it was another point of view there well, what people don't mostly un usually understand is that everything is in threes. There's was, is, and is to come. There's creation until Christ, Christ until the moment of the pre-trib, 
and then the pre-trib to the end. Was, is, and is to come. And so when they explain things like that, it's true in a sense, but they cannot all be explained. And I'll give you an example. Uh, one of the simple ones that we talk about, even in this 30-minute Bible study intro of it, it's only 30 minutes, easy to follow. There's a chart, uh, a write-up that you can follow as well, and you can print one print download, study notes, uh, one print down, I mean, one uh, click download to watch it on your computer or to save it to your computer, your phone, tablet, whatever you want. And what you find is, is a very simple one is the differences within the Gospels and the color of robe that Jesus wears. So, for example, Matthew, Mark, and Luke you know that scripture tells us the last will be first, the first will be last. So once you understand this and you go into the differences in the Gospels, as you begin to realize what the, the point of these differences are in the Gospels and you realize that it's prophecy, you are going to be floored. So much of the Bible from beginning to end will begin to open to you. And in Luke, for example... Before going to the cross, Jesus is arrayed in a gorgeous robe. And it means white, radiant, beautiful, gorgeous, okay, like a bride. In Mark's gospel, he's arrayed in purple. In Matthew's gospel, he's arrayed in scarlet. Well, the pre-trib Gentile bride going first. See? And he's arrayed in white. So you've got this typology of the white of the pre-trib bride going first. Then you've got purple and scarlet. Well, the woman who rides the beast is wearing what? She's the tribulation, right? The, the woman, uh, Mystery Babylon, she's riding the beast and she's wearing purple and scarlet. And you've got Mark and Matthew. Mark and Matthew represent those who are left behind. So what you start to realize is there's a pre-trib group, a mid-trib group, and a post-trib group. And you say, what? And you start to realize, oh, wait a second, pre, mid, and post are all true. Maybe that's why everybody can go to the scriptures and point to scriptures that are revealing pre-trib. And others say, no, look at this. This is mid-trib. And others say, no, look at this. This is post-trib. And they can all do it with scripture. And everybody debates their own position and, and they can't see between each other's positions because they're so stuck on their positions. When the truth is, there's a reason why all three can show their positions with scripture. Because pre, mid, and post are all true. So that's just one little glimpse of even what's in this 30-minute video of this second one in the series of four. Once you get past the series of four and you really want to go deep, this one's a three-hour teaching of the same thing, but much more than the 30-minute one here. So once you finish that 31 and you begin to get an understanding of, of what's being revealed in these differences in the Gospels, these things that cannot be explained by simply perspective, and you realize that it's prophecy, well, then it really starts to open to you. Because if pre, mid, and post are true, and there's a discourse in Mark, a discourse in Matthew, I mean, a discourse in Luke, Mark, and Matthew, and they're all speaking differently, then it starts to open to you even more. And what you'll start to realize is this next video is a, again another 30 minute intro study to the revelation of 14 years and what you come to find out is luke's discourse is a short period of time probably the period it's pre-trib and then the period of 40 days but there's a 50-day window of events that happen that start with the pre-trib and a 50-day window of events that happen before the 14 years begin and the 14 years will begin at the red horse rider the white horse rider takes place in that portion of the 50, and he's here for 40 days. And you say, I know if you're new, you're thinking, man, this guy's out to lunch. Seven years is too much. Well, why would you worry about how long tribulation is if you're in Christ's spirit filled? If you're watching and praying, it doesn't matter how long the tribulation's going to be. You, you should be watching and praying to be accounted worthy to escape all these things and to stand before the Son of Man. All right? Luke 21, 36. So once you do start to understand, once you start to, to seek and search it out, it'll all start to open. But you need to understand those differences in the Gospels. So you'll realize that there's seven years of seals and there are seven years of trumpets. And once you see that and you understand these differences through the Gospels, I'm telling you, 
it will blow your mind. And I'm telling you, it is worth every moment of time that you spend digging into it. I promise you, pray over it. Ask the spirit to guide you, to lead you, to open up the understanding to you. And then when you get to the fourth video, this is the one that helps you understand it all. The fourth video, this one's a big one. It's about two hours and 45 minutes. And just like the title says, it's all because of Matthew. All of our lives and for centuries, churches, pastors, uh, theologians, everybody's foundation comes from the gospel of Matthew. Because it was never yet made known, because it simply wasn't the timing of the Lord to make it known, everybody's foundation of the Gospels comes from Matthew, and they look a little bit at Mark and even less at Luke for other things. So anytime somebody really goes into the rest of Scripture, unbeknownst to them, because their focus has always been on Matthew all of their lives, everything else that they see, they think fits into a seven-year slot. So either they're pre or they're mid or they're post, but it's based on a seven-year count because of Matthew. Their perspective is the Jews. So what they haven't understood is the first will be last, the last will be first. Matthew, Mark, Luke goes Luke, Mark, Matthew. And it goes Luke pre-trib, Mark's mid-trib, and Matthew's post-trib. And what this equals is in this pre, mid, and post, it is the ready, watching, diligent, uh, loving the Lord, uh, watching and praying in Christ, spirit-filled, his ready bride that's going pre-trib. The Mark group, which is the mid-trib in the seventh year of seals, that is the rest of the world. The Gentiles that are grafted into the house of Israel, they're all together scattered all over the world, and they are the church as well. But they weren't ready. They were still caught up in the things of this world, and they weren't ready. They, they claimed Christ, and I'm not saying that they won't be saved at the, uh, uh, at the mid-trib great multitude rapture, but only if they can endure. Remember, we're, we're in the Laodicean age right now. Once the pre-trib happens, the seven churches will start all over again uh, in the end of days, and it will be a great time, the biggest revival in all of human history within chaos during the time of seals, and then the great multitude rapture in the seventh year of seals. So what happens is, <clears throat> excuse me, is because Matthew has never been understood in its relation to the differences from Mark and Luke, everybody's perspective is unbeknownst to them seven years because of Matthew. Matthew is to the house of Judah. Mark is to the house of Israel for which the Gentiles are grafted in. And Luke is to the Gentile or the bride of Christ. Pre, mid, post or Luke, Mark, Matthew, or Bride, House of Israel, Gentiles grafted in, and Judah. Remember, the House of Israel and the House of Judah, they've divided in the House of Israel the ten tribes that people call the lost tribes are scattered throughout the earth and they're mixed in with all the Gentiles. But Judah are the Jews. So in the land of Israel right now, even though they occupy the land of Israel, of the house of Israel and the land of Judah, of the house of Judah, it's only Judah that's in the land. And that's a big deal to understand. It's only Judah that's in the land. And we know why it's important to understand that within the ministry as well. Because the, it, the, the, the count, right? Understanding the end of days and this timing that we've taught with Leviticus 19, um, understanding the differences between accession and non-accession, between the house of Israel and the house of Judah and how they counted their kings. All of these things are, are revelations and parts and pieces that have been all weaved together here over the years. It's absolutely fantastic. And that's why this year, 2024, out of all the years we have ever watched, this is the absolute unequivocal highest watch in all of human history for the true end of days to begin because there is a count of when they come back into the land and it's vital to understand it to be able to have a glimpse an idea of the year and the time frame that we're in because 70 years is key all right so 
with that, you can go, like I said, ministryrevealed.com or come to this playlist. And then you can go from there and it just gets awesome, awesome, awesome deep. So with that, let's go into the search. So this was the search. Sand of the sea. And this is where it's really all beginning. We see the first time. So we see in the Old Testament, the last time it appears is Hosea chapter 1, verse 10. But we're going to start. We'll get back to this a little bit later on into the video once we get to the Hosea part. And we see right here in Genesis 32, 12, it starts with, And thou saidest, I will surely do thee good and make thy seed as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. Well, right off the bat, if you understand pre, mid, and post, you know what that's talking about. Uh, the sand of the sea in a number that is not countable. We have an understanding of that, don't we? Like, like you mean the great multitude without number? That, that's the mid-trib. This has nothing to do with the pre-trib. You see, people that think that, that the pre-trib comes first and it's everybody as the sand of the sea and it's the great multitude they read chapter 7 and think chapter 7 of revelation is coming before the seals even begin yet chapter 7 of revelation is the end after the six years after the sixth seal and before the seventh seal it's there between chapter 6 and chapter 8 the great multitude rapture is the mid-trib those of the sand of the sea without number and I'm going to prove it to you. So the next place, this is the first place it's mentioned. The next place is where it really gets good. So it's in Genesis 41, verse 49. So let's go to Genesis 41. We start in verse 46. Check this out. You guys are going to see these connections. I touched on it a little bit at the in the last video to give you guys a glimpse of when it was coming. And it says in verse 46, Joseph was 30 years old. When he stood before uh, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and then it says in verse 47, in the seven plenteous years, the earth brought forth by handfuls. We're going to see what this handfuls is that he brought forth, but let's go into it. Into Genesis in this ESORD program that we use, because when we use this ESORD program, it's so awesome because look at what we get. You got the Strong's Concordance at your fingertips. So look what we're seeing. To grasp, okay? So grasping, having something held in your hand. To grasp it with hand, to take by a handful. This is used four times, which is very interesting in itself. Wait until we go a little bit further. This is just the start of it. So in the seventh year of plenty, <coughs> which means what's happening during those seven years of plenty? During those seven years of plenty, they're bringing in by the handfuls, right? They're able to scoop up and they're bringing it in by the handfuls. Well, what are they bringing in by the handfuls? Well, first of all, what are the handfuls that are taking place? If we go into Luke chapter 10, you guys know from Luke chapter 10, in our chapters to years, <coughs> excuse me, that we're about two and a half years, right, in that third year give or take two and a half years, as the beast is about to show up. But what do we know happens? He talks about the handfuls. Jesus, in, in John 10, verse 25, it says, Jesus, Jesus answered them, I told you, and you believe me not, the works that I do, uh, the works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you believe not, because you are not of my sheep. Remember, Jesus is a lamb, but they're not of his sheep, right? We'll talk about that again. We've touched on it recently. As I said unto you, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Now listen to what happens. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. So we're seeing right here, <coughs> excuse me, this representation of being in the seven years of seals. 
in the seven years. And we're seeing this just like Joseph, 30 years in the seven years. And what is it? He's talking about the earth bringing handfuls in, grasping them and bringing this in by the handfuls. What is this telling you? This is directly relating to this period of seals and the great multitude that's coming in. Now, these multitude are referred to in John as sheep, right? Because it's the sheep that are hearing his voice. And we'll touch on what this says earlier in John when we get in a little bit further and you'll see the connection. But what else is going on here? Well, just like the pre-trib, what? who are the pre-trib? They're lambs, right? They're stones. Uh, they're wheat. You see, there are a variety of things. Well, the same thing is being applied here. Not only are they sheep for the ones that are the ones that are his, but there's something of them being plucked out that can't be taken out of his hand. And they're not only sheep, they're also wheat. Remember, there are two wheats, right? There are two wheats. So, sorry, one second. One second, one second. So there are, there are two types of wheat. We're going to touch on that as well. This is kind of laying the foundation of what we're seeing. And this is just a simple one to say, there he is, Joseph, 30 years old, in the seven years of seals, in that seventh year of plenteous. He, there, there's the handfuls that have taken place. We know from the chapters to years, we know here is Jesus talking about his sheep. We know that this is the, the, the time during seals, which is in the midst of those seven years. And you've got this same commentary of not being able to take it out of his hand. He's grabbing them by the handfuls. Now, now who's bringing in these handfuls? This is, this is where it starts to get interesting, too, because when you look up the word handfuls, let's go into John. We look up handfuls, or sorry, in Genesis. We see, as I told you, it's used four times. Check this out. There it is in Genesis 41, 47. And the next three are all in Leviticus. And listen to what it says. And he shall bring it to Aaron's sons, the priests. So he's going to take a piece out for himself, but the rest of it is brought what? To Aaron's sons, the priests. The rest of them is about talking about bringing it to the priests, which is precisely what's taking place during seals. You see, because at the pre-trib, there is the pre-trib group who is taken out, and there is the remnant that remain to serve the Lord, as we've taught on in many occasions, very, very in-depth. You see, so right within it, who are the ones with these handfuls? Who are the ones bringing in these handfuls? It's those who are serving Christ. It's, it's that remnant group of workers from the Luke pre-trib that were chosen to remain and to serve the Lord during the time of seals. They'll be with them for 40 days and then they'll serve during the time of seals. It's exactly what their job is, is to bring in the great multitude there to bring in this the greatest revival in this power and the authority and the understanding that they're going to have and we're seeing this already just with this little glimpse of handfuls and none will be able to take them out of his hand they're referred to as sheep but we also know that they're referred to as wheat so watch this in relation to sheep he says <clears throat> in john chapter 10 Verse 16, you, I'm showing you this now again to remember when we get to it. <clears throat> it says, and other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Them also must I bring. They all shall hear my voice and they shall be one fold and one shepherd. There's two. <coughs> Excuse me. There are two sheep folds two sheep folds but at one point these two sheep folds will become one and he will be the one shepherd therefore does my father love me because i lay down my life that i might take it again we all know where this is leading to right no man taketh it from me 
but I lay it down of myself. I have no power to lay it down. And I, sorry, I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. Again, take it again, take it again. We know he's got to do this again, right? <clears throat> and then, of course, then it brings in to the time of what we just showed. Nobody could pluck them out of my hands. But you're going to want to remember this. We know this is mid-seals. We know he is working one sheepfold during seals. But at the end of seals, after that sheepfold, that one sheepfold is brought in, another one will also come in right after it. And the two will become one. You're going to see what I'm talking about. But here's a glimpse. We shared on it before. Recently. Remember in John 21. When Jesus tells uh, Simon Peter, right? Three times. Feed my lambs. Then he says, feed my sheep. And feed my sheep. When we shared on this recently. We were able to explain this is pre. This is mid. And this is post. Is a way to look at it or this is the bride this is the house of israel and this is the house of judah the house of judah or sorry the house of israel which is the gentiles and uh, grafted in with the house of israel that's the sheep that he said and then he what did he say and other sheep i have well that's the house of judah and once these two come in together he will be the one shepherd over them. But the lambs, why is the first one called lambs? Because Jesus is called the lamb. We, we really, you know, we really pounded on this a few, a couple or so videos ago when we, when we understood that everybody that goes pre-trib or that is chosen to remain, everybody pre-trib, they're co-heirs with Christ. So Christ is the, is the heir and we are co-heirs with him. Christ is the stone, and we are the little stones that cry out. Jesus is the lamb. We are lambs. Jesus is the light, and we'll have his light. So it's it's like it's like people would say, like little Jesus is right? It's we are little lambs. We are little stones. We are all a piece of him that are pre-trib. And of those who are chosen to remain, they're the ones who are the priests that I talked about, Aaron's sons, the priests, who are gathering up the sheep they're the ones gathering the sheep they're the ones bringing in by the handful not only sheep which is one of the references of them but also wheat remember there's the pre-wheat lambs and there's the mid-trib wheat sheep right the leahs and the rachel in relation to the 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 old and the new we'll touch on that in a bit as well then, what do we see now as we get further into this? And that was just to cover the handfuls and, and to be able to show this connection of what's coming in during the time of seals, during the seven years of seals. Because, you see, this is where people have been so twisted up. We've shared on this differently in the past when it comes to Genesis 41. And what people, you know, it happens, it's happened more often than any other way. When people try to say, oh, the 14 years that Ministry Revealed talks about, you know, it's seven years of plenty, then seven years of lack. Oh, that was just the seven years that come before the seven years of tribulation. That's what they try to always impose on what the revelation is that's been happening. And I keep telling them, no, that's not what it is. You haven't understood what the seven years of plenty is before the seven years of famine. They haven't understood it. And it's the same thing they'll go, you know, recently we had shared about um, uh, Genesis 29 or, or 31 when it gets to Leah and Rachel and 14 years and then six more years for the cattle. And they think it's the seven years of the 14 and of the 14 and then six years of cattle being something else. And they'll try to say, oh, that's the first, you know, no, people need to take the time to watch, to watch the teachings. To, to pay attention and to follow along. Because these seven years of plenty are not the seven years that we are in 
of what we call the easy years where he's been working for Leah. The seven years of plenty are talking about the, the revival that is going to take place during the first seven years of seals. And it's a handful being, it's handfuls being brought in to Christ during the time of seals. That's what's going on. And I could prove it to you. Watch this. That's the, and that's why this opening scene and understanding the handfuls and none shall escape out of his hand and, and understanding that they're sheep, but they're also a type of wheat and, and they're, you know, all of these representations. We keep going in Genesis 41, 48. And he gathered up all the food of the seven years, which were in the land of Egypt, laid it up for food in the cities. The food of the field, which was round about every city, he, uh, laid he up in the same. Now listen to this. And Joseph gathered corn as the sand of the sea. Very much until he left numbering, for it was without number. What did Joseph gather? Joseph gathered. So Joseph, 30 years old, during the seven years of seals is the representation of this, where they're being brought in by the handfuls, people being saved in the midst of the chaos of seals. And what is he doing when the seven years are over? It's wheat. It's wheat. It's wheat. Watch this. Wheat that what? That was made bright. That is to that is brightened. See, to clean, to be clean had to be what? Purged out. Does that sound familiar to some of you guys? How about this? Remember this in uh Revelation chapter 7? Watch this. When we talked about the word white, it said in great tribulation have washed their robes. See, they had to wash their robes to plunge them, to launder them, to wash them. And they what? Made them white. They had to make them white. They had to get them whitened. They had to be made brightened. And this word is only used twice. And what do we know it relates to? You got it. Mark chapter 9, which is a picture of Mount Transfiguration in Mark after six days being the after six years of seals. And what do we see? No white than the fuller snow. I mean, we've got a teaching with the fuller too. It's so awesome. And he what? No earth can whiten them. This is the picture of we know of the Lord coming at the end of the six years of seals, days as years. And what, what does that make it? The seventh year. When's the great multitude rapture? In the seventh year. It's the exact same timing. And who is it? <clears throat> it's Jesus who's doing it. It's Jesus who's doing it. But he's being represented here as Joseph. He's being represented as Joseph. Well, why would he be being represented as Joseph, do you think? Because of the revelation we've understood that when Jesus comes at the end of the six years of seals to start the seventh year of seals, he's coming as who? Messiah ben Joseph. Right? Messiah ben Joseph or, or Messiah ben Ephraim, right? He's going to be high priest and king. It's the exact representation of him coming for the great multitude rapture wheat, which is as the sand of the sea, which is without number. Which is without number. Watch this. So as we keep going, we see without number, but what else did we see? It was the word for wheat, okay? So wheat as the sand of the sea without number, connected to Joseph being 30 years old. It's, it's so awesome. And let's see what that brings us to. The Hebrew word for corn, which is, as we just saw, it's specifically talking about wheat. And it starts where? In Genesis 41, verse 35, which was just a few verses earlier, is the first place that it shows up. Where is it? 
right here, okay? And this is actually very specific because this word for wheat we see is 1250. So the Hebrew word 1250. You'll see why that's important as we go further as well. So we go to see where the wheat is. There it is in Genesis 41, verse 49. And the next place it's found, connected to the gathering. <laughs> you're going to love this. Because what you're going to see next is precisely what we've been teaching for years. And, and over the last few years, in relation to, again, when he comes as Messiah ben Joseph, we know what he's going to do. We know what it involves. We know what he's going to have to do again. This is, this is absolutely undeniable, even stronger proof than what we've shown in the past about the understanding of the 14 years, the seven and the seven in relation to Joseph. You see, what we used to talk on is as we get down in Genesis 41, 51 and 52 is what he says here. So we know he ends up having two kids during the, the famine years. Okay, he has Messiah, uh, sorry, he has, um, the firstborn is, is uh, Manasseh, and Manasseh is causing to forget. And then the other one, the second one is Ephraim, for which Ephraim gets the double portion. Ephraim is son of, of Joseph, right? And that's exactly what we're talking about. Messiah ben Joseph to Messiah ben Ephraim, he calls his firstborn, remember? And what ends up happening? In verse 52, he says, for God hath caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. In the land of his affliction, trouble, depression. It means those seven years in that land is tribulation. Sure, he's in a place elevated in power, but it's in the land of tribulation that he's in. He's in his enemy's land. And most people haven't understood that. So when they try to come against us on 14 years and try to use the story of Joseph and think that that's what we're saying, they've completely misunderstood that he was already in the land of his infliction of affliction for the first seven years. And what you have to understand is what's being revealed here is that this plenty is all about the wheat that is being gathered in as the sand of the sea without number in the seventh year, or you could say the in seventh year at the end of the seventh year. It is all about seals. So who do we know comes in at the end of seals? Who comes in first? Well, remember where it leads to? Gen uh, Genesis 42, verse 3. But before we get there, what's important to remember? Spring wheat versus winter wheat. Remember, spring wheat is sown in the spring and is harvested in the fall. You know, that September into maybe middish October. Winter wheat is the one that's sown in the fall, lives through winter, and is harvested in summer. The winter wheat, we have covered this a million times, is the pre-trib Leah, Gentile bride of Christ at the true feast of weeks. Spring wheat, is the is the Rachel is the is the second wheat harvest, which is the great multitude rapture wheat. That's the Leah, that's the Rachel, and you're going to see how it's perfectly connected into all of this. So, look what happens if the if we're not talking about anything of the winter wheat because Leah, who is the pre-trib, she's already gone. Okay, where where are we in this? We're, we're now talking about the seventh year of seals. So the handfuls have been coming in. They've been going to the priests, right? They've been bringing in and grasping them by the handfuls, bringing them to the Lord. It's all about handfuls of wheat as the sand of the sea, as, this, as the group of sheep, this first group of sheep that know his voice. They're the ones coming in first. This is all about the great multitude rapture that Messiah ben Joseph or Messiah ben Ephraim is the one who is then bringing in and it, it, it's all related to the great multitude rapture. So what we're talking about here 
is the spring wheat of the second wheat harvest, which is the one that is harvested at the time of fall. Okay? So now watch this. In chapter 42, it says, Now when Jacob saw that there was corn in Egypt, Jacob said unto his sons, Why do you look one upon another? And he said, Behold, I have heard that there was corn in Egypt. Get you down thither and buy for us from thence that we may live and not die. Now listen to this. Joseph's ten brethren went down to buy corn in Egypt. Check this out. This word for corn isn't what you think it is. And this word for corn isn't what you think it is. This one is. Watch this. Why is this so important? Watch what happens. It's an absolute prophetic picture directly related. Where are we? Chapter 42. Directly related to everything we're talking about. Look at this. Here's corn as grain, as victuals, as kernel. Look, I heard there was corn there. We've got to go to Egypt. It's the 7668. There it is again, 7668. But when they get there, Look at what they represent in verse chapter 42, verse three of Genesis and Joseph's 10 brethren, 10 brethren. The, you mean like the lost tribes? You mean like the, the 10 tribes that have scattered went down to buy corn, went down to get wheat. It's an exact prophetic picture of the great multitude rapture that Joseph brings in, that the priests were bringing in by the handfuls, and in the seventh year, Joseph brings them into the land. They are the ten tribes. And it is Joseph as a Messiah, Ben Joseph. But look who's held back. But Benjamin, Joseph's brother, Jacob, sent not with his brethren in case something would befall him. But the ten brethren went. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Does that sound at all familiar? How about 2nd Esdras? Remember how 2nd Esdras chapter 13 plays out, starting in verse 29? Behold, the days are coming when the Most High will deliver, all, uh, will deliver those who are upon the earth. This is the pre-trib. And bewilderment of mind will come. Then they shall plan to make war. Then they will plan to make war against another. This is nation against nation. This is the red horse rider, the beginning of 14 years. This is the pre-trib right here. This is during the 50 days and bewilderment and craziness starts. And then after the 50 days, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, 14 years begins red horse rider. And then all the things of seals that I've told you would take place, the events that will take place, then my son will be revealed. And look what happens. An innumerable, verse 34, and an innumerable multitude shall be gathered together, as you saw, desiring to come to conquer him. But he shall stand on top of Mount Zion. And Zion will come to be made manifest to all people, prepared and built. Remember, he's coming with paradise, the place prepared. As you saw, the mountain carved without hands. That's the end of the sixth seal. That's why the whole world is in a panic, right? They're seeing him. He's coming with paradise. And now listen to this. Check it out. Okay, you can see he's going to reprove them. You saw it by the storm. Um, torments of evil, torture symbolized by the flames of fire. Now listen to verse 29 and 30. And as for your seeing him gather to himself another multitude that was peaceable, these are the ten tribes. Wait, what? The ten tribes coming as wheat at the time of Joseph who is represented as Jesus, as Joseph, Messiah, Ben Joseph. It's the exact storyline. Listen to this. Which were led away from their own land into captivity in the days of King Hosea. All of this is the exact same storyline we've been sharing. Here he is, and look what happens. Joseph's there, who is a picture here of Messiah Jesus in the seventh year of seals. The corn has been gathered. It's the seventh year. The father finds out, and the ten tribes are coming down to buy corn. This prophetic picture of them being the corn, them being the, the sheep, which is the great multitude group, 
just as second Ezra is saying because it's the time of what it's the time of the spring wheat harvest which happens in the fall and listen to what it says in verse 6 of 40 Genesis 42 and Joseph was the governor over the land and he it was that sold to all the people of the land listen to this and Joseph's brethren came and bowed down themselves before him there with their faces to the earth it's exactly the same prophetic picture now watch this not only now are we clearly able to show that the first seven years in the land of affliction was showing us that yeah it was during the time of seals was the picture but we can now show that this that this um plenty has nothing to do about an actual plenty that's going to take place during seals with the exception of the plenty being that it is the greatest revival in human history that is the representation of that plenty harvest from the story of joseph in the prophetic is to come the story wasn't talking about yes there was a time where we're in plenty now and then it's only going to be seven years of famine for seals it had nothing to do with that it was all about the plenty of the greatest revival in human history to bring in the great multitude, which is going to be as the sand of the sea, represented as the wheat. And here they are. The first group to come in is this set of sheep that we were talking about in John chapter 10 when he said, this sheep is mine, but there's still another one that I have to bring in as well. Well, let's see if we can put this together. We talked about this teacher of righteousness, right? Man, those of you who have been around for a while and have understood and been following this stuff, <laughs> this, this Christian forum about the teacher of righteousness in the end of days, it is so mind-blowing once you understand what's been going on here in this ministry. It's insanity. You know, but this, this conversation about it is is understanding but what they miss in here as well because the whole world has missed it is they too only think of a seven-year tribulation so they don't realize that the teacher of righteousness is also going to be here during seals because it's said that the teacher of righteousness will be here until the messiah ben joseph and messiah ben david show up we know who messiah ben david is and we know who Mess well we believe I, I believe i know who messiah ben david is but we know also for sure who messiah ben joseph is and we know that they don't come till the end of six years of seals when they're officially there on the scene. Which means the teacher of righteousness, of course, will be here at least till the end of seals. End of the six year of seals. But now listen to this. Messiah ben Joseph and Messiah ben David, they're coming at the end of the six year of seals. But Messiah ben David will have already been here. But he was being prepared. Messiah ben Joseph is christ when he's coming with paradise okay listen to what it says this is in relation to the two messiahs coming at the end of seals or being revealed really at the end of seals the purpose of these two individuals listen to this is to first messiah ben joseph who is messiah ben joseph well messiah ben joseph is is also jesus the Son of Man, when he's revealed on heavenly Mount Zion and gathering the ten tribes to him during the time of King Hosea when he took them away. So listen to what it says. <clears throat> the purpose of these two individuals is to first, so the first one that's going to matter here, is Messiah ben Joseph because he's going to what? Gather the ten lost tribes. Um, he, he what? He's going to what? Gather the ten lost tribes at the time of corn and in that, that grabbing and bringing in by the handfuls the great multitude of this, of this corn harvest? This wheat harvest of the great multitude? And, and you've got the same thing in the Apocrypha in 2nd Ezra's revealing that it's Christ? And that he's coming on Mount Zion. And what is Mount Zion? Mount Zion is paradise, which John 14, chapter 14 of John, 21 chapter, seventh year of seals, is paradise, the place that he's coming that he prepared. 
It's incredible. So watch what happens. And then it says, and then Messiah ben David. So we know there's a Messiah ben Joseph and a Messiah ben David. They'll come at the same time. But Messiah ben David will have already been here. He is somebody that's alive now. I believe I have an idea of who he may be. I generally don't talk about it. I've mentioned it a couple times over the last couple of three years. But Messiah ben Joseph is absolutely Messiah Jesus. And he is Messiah ben Joseph or, or as Ephraim. Okay, as Messiah ben Ephraim. So Messiah ben Ephraim, as we know, is the one who's bringing the ten tribes. He's bringing in the great multitude at the end of seals. Exactly like the story of Moses. Moses takes him into the wilderness. Then they're in the wilderness. Then they come out. Moses isn't allowed to cross over. And why? Because the rock was struck twice. Jesus is the rock. We'll touch on that a little bit later too. And so Moses isn't able to take him over. And who takes them over? Uh, Caleb? And Caleb was of Judah though. Who's the other one? Joshua. Yeshua. And, and where is Joshua Yeshua from? He's from the tribe of Ephraim. He's from the tribe of Ephraim. And so once Joshua Yeshua crosses them into the promised land, it says, then Messiah ben David reunites both the houses of Israel once again. Why is it that Messiah ben David is the one that reunites them? Well, because the ones that are missing is what we would call the tribes of Judah. Right? Remember, Benjamin wasn't there. Benjamin was held back. And what do we see? Why does David, why is David the one that reunites them? Because at the end of seals, at the end of the sixth year of seals, there's a war that takes place that destroys all the enemies of Israel that come to gather around, right? That come to gather against them, right? When they see the Lord coming on heavenly Mount Zion, the Lord is going to destroy all the enemies. We know this is the first sword and the and the, the, the ten kings as the ten horns. But once he does that, and the ten tribes, the, the great multitude come in as the sand of the sea represented as the spring wheat, what is, what is the Messiah Ben David's reuniting all about? How is he getting the house of Judah to come? He's the builder, remember? He's the one who's rebuilding the temple. We've talked about this a number of times and touched on it recently. The house of Israel, uh, the house of Judah, they've been blinded for our sakes, of course. Only until the time of the Gentiles ends, which is at the end of seals, at the great multitude rapture. And at the great multitude rapture in the seventh year of seals, they will have seen all of their enemies defeated that scattered them. And then there's going to be a call to rebuild the temple. Well, who is the one who laid the foundation of the temple during seals? The Messiah Ben David type. So how is Messiah ben David going to be the one to reunite the Judah side? Because he's the one that is going to be overseeing the rebuilding of the temple, while Messiah ben Joseph, who is the high priest and king who gathered in the ten tribes, is Yeshua Jesus, high priest and king, Melchizedek, and so forth, right? So watch what happens. We again can show this just like we do the others in our chapters to years. So in the chapters to years, we were just showing with, uh, where was I? <laughs> just, oh, there we go. And say, so I lost my train of thought. So what happens is going into Zechariah 6, if we go into our chapters to years, we go to Zechariah chapter 6. This is a picture of the end of the sixth year of seals playing out within the chapters of the 14 chapters of Zechariah and 14 of Hosea. But here we are, and it's a prophetic picture like the end of the sixth year of seals. So we go to Zechariah and look at what we see. 
it starts in verse 11, Zechariah 6, verse 11. Then take the silver and gold and make crowns and set them upon the head of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and speak unto him, saying, saying, Thus saith, speaketh the Lord of hosts, Behold, the man whose name is the branch, and he shall grow up out of his place. You see, who's the branch growing up out of his place? That's Zerubbabel. Okay? Joshua is the high priest and king. He is the one with the greater authority than the Zerubbabel, who is the one that is growing up out of this place. And he shall build the temple of the Lord. Who's the one building the temple? It's not Joshua. It's not Joseph. Messiah ben Joseph or Messiah uh, um, ben Ephraim, who represents Joseph. It is Joshua. Uh, sorry, sorry, it is Zerubbabel. And we know this because in Zechariah 4 9, which represents mid seals, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also finish it. Hello. If his hands are going to finish it, and it's telling you that it's the branch, the, ones who, the one whose name is the branch, who's going to grow up out of this place, he shall build the temple. It just told you who it was. Which means Joshua, who is the high priest and king, he's not the one building the temple. It's Zerubbabel building the temple. And a lot of them prophetically, even with a lot of the rabbis, have missed this and believe that, that it's going to be um, Messiah ben Joseph who's going to rebuild the temple. You know, there's always, there's, nobody is ever completely agreeing on the same thing ever, right? But this is very, very clear. It, this doesn't take a lot to understand. Just go back to Zechariah chapter 4. So here we have Messiah ben Joseph as Joshua high priest and king. And how can we prove that Joseph or Messiah uh, um, or Joshua, who is the high priest and king, is really the E from character, okay? <clears throat> Watch what happens. Uh, da, 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 da. Numbers. This is where we kind of diverge a little bit because remember, in Numbers chapter 13, verse 6, it says of the tribe of Judah, Caleb. Verse 18 says of the tribe of Ephraim, Osi, the son of Nun. This is where everything exploded about a little over three years. Uh, oh, my goodness. Four years ago now. When this revelation that the Holy Ghost confirmed in 2020 on March 10th to the 11th, right as, yeah, right as the you know what was being proclaimed for the world. This had happened the night of and the following day. It was revealed in the understanding. Watch this. So of the tribe of Ephraim, Osi. Who is Osi? Hosea, which means deliverer, right? Hosea, whose name is Yeshua, Joshua. Yeshua, salvation, victory. Jesus, in the seals portion, at the end of seals when he's coming, as Messiah ben Joseph, or they would say, you can also say Messiah ben Ephraim, because he is of the tribe of Ephraim through his father Joseph, he is coming as what? He was deliverer. See, he was deliverer. And then what happens? And he is the son of Noon. What does Noon mean? Noon means his father. His father's name was Noon, and his father's name's name means perpetuity. Perpetuity. Perpetual. Continued. Everlasting. See? Jesus and the father and what does moses do in numbers 13 16 it says these are the names of the men which went with moses sent to spy out the land and moses called osi so he changes hosea deliverer the son of noon to joshua yeshua he changes his name to joshua so when you go to zechariah and you're seeing in chapter 6 that joshua in the same type is being made high priest and king. And we know that there's what? 
we know that there is two that spied out the land, one from Judah and one from Ephraim. And you've got one later on in Zechariah that represents Ephraim as Joshua high priest and king, as from the tribe of Ephraim through Joseph, the father. And you've got Judah represented as Caleb and Judah in the future represented as who? Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel being from the Messiah ben David. That's the relation at the end of seals. You see, that's why it said he had to grow up out of that place. It didn't say Joseph. It didn't say um, um, it didn't say Joshua did. See, the crowns are going upon the head of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest. So he's high priest and king. But it says, behold, the man whose name is the branch and he shall grow up out of his place. He's going to grow up out of his place. You see, when you go to Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel's name, let's go to it. Zerubbabel's name means the descendant who is from Babylon, but he's a Jew born in Babylon. A Jew born in Babylon. See, tribe of Judah. Tribe of Judah born in Babylon. And he's the one that's going to build it. So we're seeing this now. You're starting to grasp and to see what's going on. That Jesus as Messiah ben Joseph or Messiah ben Ephraim. Who becomes Joshua Yeshua. High priest and king. Is gathering the ten tribes. Which is in the seventh year of seals. Which is the spring wheat. Represented to the sheep group. After the lambs from John 21. <clears throat> which represents the the Rachel wheat. And then you have Messiah Ben David, who's going to reunite. And why is Ben David reuniting? Because at the end of seals, there's the battle of Revelation chapter 17, which is the first sword from Luke 22, when Jesus says, ah, two swords is enough. And we see them right here, the ten horns. And we see them with the ten horns. Da -da -da -da. And they shall come make war against them. And he's called Lord of Lords, King of Kings. Only one uppercase in each. And they make war and he overcomes them. Once he makes war and he overcomes them, what happens next? There's the declaration that's going to rebuild the temple. So once these ten tribes come in and the Gentiles that are grafted in with them come in, the Gentile age is over. When the Gentile age is over, the blinders are going to come off the Jews. You understand? Because the Jews have been blinded, as I said earlier, for our sakes. And when their blinders come off, it's because it's the end of the Gentile age. And what's suddenly being fulfilled? What they've been waiting for in their prophecies that haven't yet been fulfilled. They're waiting for a Messiah ben Joseph and a Messiah ben David. They're waiting for their enemies that are going to come against them. And then the Lord who is going to come, this Messiah ben Joseph, that will destroy their enemies. They will start to be gathered back. But then there will also be the declaration to rebuild the third temple. They're going to think it's going to happen at the beginning of seals tribulation. But we know it's not going to happen. It'll be seven years from them being scattered before the temple will actually get start to get rebuilt. And it's Messiah ben David, who is of the tribe of Judah, who was raised up, who represents Zerubbabel, who is the one who is going to rebuild the temple, who is going to oversee the temple. Which means in the seventh year, by mid-seals is the great multitude rapture. And in the second half of the seventh year of seals, the house of Judah is also going to come in. So you will have what at this point? By the end of the seventh year of seals, you will have the two sheepfold as one. The house of Israel with the Gentiles grafted in and the house of Judah, and they will become two sheepfold with one head. It's going to happen by the end of the seventh year of seals. Remember how this all came about? With Ephraim and Osi and Nun. 
and it all revealed this is like i said we go down a little trail here because this got really crazy back in 2020 it got so crazy i prayed a, I prayed a fervent prayer in a way i'd never been this type of determination of saying lord i need an answer and you guys know the story i heard back from from a sister who said the spirit told her the number 50 and in brackets that the spirit told her to tell me right on target you guys know i go to look up the word right on target from that teaching and i find out it means taurus not only taurus it means this eye of taurus and we come to find out that within taurus it says to the early hebrews taurus was the first constellation in the zodiac and consequ consequently it was represented by the first letter of the hebrew alphabet <coughs> of course which is aleph but this became a big deal because then i go to look up taurus because aleph is the beginning and we now find out that in the beginning of creation in the beginning literally in the beginning is jesus jesus is represented as the beginning which is what the head of taurus it's called aleph and then we discovered that this eye looking up into heaven not looking down but if up, us looking up into heaven our right his left looking down this eye of taurus is called ayin it's literally called i or ayin this one is called aldebaran and this one aldebaran is the 14th brightest star in the sky and you're like wait a second what ayin means i that that's a hebrew name this i in taurus literally has a hebrew word for the name which means i and it's in that constellation the head of taurus which was the beginning it was in the beginning of creation it was month one so you've got i taurus being one and then another i and things start to get freaky right we start to look into this and dig this up some more and what do we find we find that jesus they discovered a pendant on the shroud of turin and all of these detailed imageries and the laser and all these tests that they've done on it over the years revealed that this is what was on it ayin aleph noon now we read left to right the jews go right to left ayin Ayin was what? Ayin is the name of the right eye of Taurus Look as we look up. And it's in what? Aleph. Aleph is called the beginning. Aleph is Taurus. So you've got the right eye of Taurus. You've got it in Aleph that represents Taurus. And then look at this. You've got the name Noon. Noon is the father of Joshua. Noon is perpetuity. Noon represents what? Well, now it gets crazy because Aleph represents one, Noon represents 50, Ayin represents 70. But watch this. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. The Hebrew letter for Noon represents the 14th number in the Hebrew alphabet and is the number 50 in its numerical counting. Which means this Aldebaran I, which it has the name Aldebaran, is not only the 14th brightest star in the sky, it represents the number 50 as the 14th brightest star in the sky. And it's on the exact same imagery going right to left as noon, and noon represents 1450. Aleph represents taurus as a whole which means the beginning and ayin is the right eye and what does ayin represent ayin is the number 70 and it's the 16th letter of the hebrew alphabet which means the right eye is 16 then you've got one as beginning and then this side is 14. so if you went right to uh, left to right like we do it would be 14 1 and 16 but guess what 
it gets way crazier than that. Because Jesus is the beginning. When was Jesus born, guys? Let's go to the book of Jubilees. At the new moon of the third month, uh, came to the well of Oath, offered a sacrifice. Jacob remembered the dream that he had. So we're in the book of Jubilees. And while he was thinking about it, so it's in the third month at the new moon. And now he's into the month. And while he was thinking that he would send word to Joseph that he should come to him and that he would not go down, he remained there seven days. Okay? On the seventh of the month, then he remembers his dream and he decides to hang out and wait seven days if he might see a vision whether he should remain or go down and he celebrated the harvest festival of first fruits with old grain this is the pre-trib leah okay this is the pre-trib leah Old grain, remember, old wheat is the winter wheat that goes first, the pre-trip. And then what? On the 16th thereof, the Lord appeared unto him. So if we look at it in what we're talking about here, we would see that this now, the month of Savan, is Taurus. Okay, this year it's in June and very little of July, which means it was the seventh day, and then for seven days, he considered it like the seven day wedding we talk about. And then what? The 15th day. The 15th day. So he waited seven days if he might see a vision. And he celebrated the harvest festival with old grain. Which means it was on the 15th that he actually celebrated the festival of old grain. It was the third. It was the third month. Remember, it said it was the new moon of the third month. He waited seven days. Uh, sorry, sorry. It was the new moon of the third month. Then it was the seventh day of the month. And the seventh day of the month, he waits for seven days. And then what does he do? He observes the, 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 the first fruits with the old grain, which represents the marriage of the winter wheat, the Leah. And then what happens? The Lord appears on the 16th. The Lord appears on the 16th. When you see this, and here we are right here, if this is really the 70th year, this should get a lot of people excited in this time frame right now. We know it does, right? It's something that we've considered in the past. But why isn't that only the thing now that we look to, like, man, that should be it. Because this is, it's just all about the third month. It's literally about the wedding. And then the Lord appearing on the 16th day. So do you recognize it with the imagery? With the imagery? If the left eye is 14, right? And the number 50. And the 16th is the 16th letter 70. So you got the 16th letter representing 70. You got the 14th letter representing 50, and right in the middle is 15. But it, it, it's, it's not, right? Because Taurus, it's 14, 16. The middle is 1 representing Taurus, right? The middle is 1. It's Aleph. How is that 15? <laughs> of course it's 15. Watch what happens. Jesus was born on the 15th day of the third month just like isaac you see we know isaac is a representation of jesus and it says in the third month in the middle of the month in the days which the lord said unto abraham on the festival of the harvest isaac was born isaac was born he was born on the 15th day of the third month so jesus being the beginning being aleph in the beginning would mean jesus was born and of course we've shared on this and we've talked about it and 
Others have broken it down and shown it through through traveling the world, doing all these studies from the, the planetarium to, to the Lord that's been traveling for decades, showing that Jesus was born in June, and it was the 15th day of the third month. So what we can see then is that the 16th and the 14th being represented by the number noon, 14, and Ayin being the 16th letter, Aleph, who is Jesus, because Aleph is the beginning. He is Jesus. He is the beginning and the end, which means he's Aleph, and he was born on the 15th day of the third month. So what do you got? 14, 15, 16. It's pretty wild, right? But don't get too, too excited. Don't get, let's not get too ahead of our skis here. <clears throat> because I'm not saying this so that you guys say, well, wait a second. Alan, why are you telling us back in, in it's going to be in June again? I thought you were telling us August. Well, remember what I just showed you. Remember what this said. To the early Hebrews, Taurus was the first constellation in their zodiac and consequently it was represented by the first letter of their alphabet with aleph we know that the sun has sped up so if this was the beginning of the year back in creation actually it would have been here but it started in taurus this would have been the word right here in the beginning would have been this time right here Right here, in the beginning. You can say right in here. <clears throat> in the beginning was in Taurus that 15th, maybe the 16th day. That's where it was. In Taurus. But that's not where it is anymore. Because the sun has fallen out of its place and it's sped up, it's now all the way over here two months early. You see, <coughs> excuse me, on on the original, on, on looking at this and seeing these things in paper and, and reading through these things within Scripture and seeing when God gave the law to Moses and, and when the law was, was written and all of these things, the sun was still in Taurus to begin the year. But over the last four, 4,500 years, it has sped up and sped up to the point now where the year starts, the Hebrew year starts back here in Nisan because the sun is sped up by two months. So what happens, <coughs> excuse me, is there had to be a calibration. Now, is Jesus still born at the connection to the 15th of Sivan because this is the third month now? Yes, Jesus was born on the third month, on the 15th day of the third month. Jesus was born then. Because we are because of the son's movement. But God, in his own right, has not moved the constellations. The sun is what caused us to begin over here because of it speeding up. But the constellations, the hands on the clock, as I've explained before, have never, ever moved. Which means to the Father, Taurus is still the beginning. And noon being the left eye, which represents 50, like 50 days that come first, and then 14 as the 14 years, which is a direct relation to the teacher of righteousness, that says the Father would be holding him up, leading him in the revelation of Scripture, is related to 5014. And the name means noon, which is the Father, which is perpetuity, the Father of Joshua Taurus. Do you understand? Joshua, who is of the tribe of Ephraim through Joseph, the, the banner of Ephraim is Taurus. It's a bull. It's a ball. And it was the beginning. So what it means is the father has never changed, but there had to be an adjustment for us living on the earth because of the son's movement. But the father 
hasn't changed. So even though it is the third month now, because it's the month of Savan, it is the third month, but to the Father, it's still Taurus, the beginning of the year to him. So when we were in Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning, if we're being as it was, so shall it be, so it was in the beginning, so shall it be in the end, then the Father has to do something. Something had to take place that's going to make up this two-month difference because the sun has gone too fast. And of course, you guys all know what that means. It all led us to the fantastic revelation of Isaiah chapter 9 where it said the first attack, as we know, happens at the beginning of 50 days after the pre-trib. Then the great light shining in the darkness, which is Jesus, is a picture of the Son of Man coming to begin the 40 days of the Son of Man as his birthday. It says, for unto us a child is born. But when we found out that the fulfillment from the was into the is, knowing that there's an is to come fulfillment, we came to understand that when Jesus fulfilled this, it never happened at his birthday. It was when Jesus heard that John was now cast into prison that he fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah when he went in to shine the great light and be the great light in the darkness. Which means we know it wasn't Jesus' birthday because Jesus' birthday, and I'm, I, you'll see how this ties in, guys. It's so awesome. It's so incredible. Because you guys will remember, when Jesus was baptized, Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age. So here was Jesus' birthday when he got baptized by John. Not when John was cast into prison, but when he was baptized by John. John wasn't cast into prison for about two months. Wait a second. You mean there was two months that the sun is sped up that needs to be accounted for to account for from the beginning and how it was in the beginning in Taurus. And we can find it in the prophecy that revealed and detailed and connected all of this together, going to Isaiah 9, bringing us to Matthew 4 and into Luke 3 to prove that it was Jesus' birthday when he was baptized by John the Baptist. And we know John the Baptist wasn't put in prison for about two more months, which means Jesus never fulfilled Isaiah 9 at his birthday, as it appeared to say, for unto us a child is born, but fulfilled it two months later. Well, hold on, wait a second. Did you also see what I'm reading here? And Jesus himself began to be what? 30 years of age. 30 years of age. And what else does it say? Being as it was supposed, the son of jo Joseph? Wait a second. You're talking about Joseph? Joseph and 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 30 years of age when he's going to be gathering in the handfuls of the corn as the sand of the sea without number? <laughs> in Luke chapter 3? The exact same chapter in the Luke in order revelation when the Joseph, the Messiah, Ben Joseph, Jesus is coming and gathering in the corn as the sand of the sea. When the, the revelation of his is of him at the time when he's about 30 years old. Well, wait a second. It just happens to be in our chapters to years. It's 2030. Huh. Huh. Funny how that happens, right? So before I keep going down that rant and, and get back onto the trail of the, the line of the sands of the sea, you just saw what happened. Now, we've covered this before, but you just saw what happened. We just saw that the revelation of this being Jesus' birth, but the sun having moved up by two months over thousands of years, the Lord God had to figure out a way for us to understand how to recalibrate this difference of two months being out because to the Father, this is the beginning. 
so this was the beginning jesus the creation of spirit of everything in the beginning when jesus began to create it all in taurus and and six thousand years later or really what is that uh 20, 20 almost twenty thousand years later minus 14 years no i guess nineteen thousand or so years later whatever that exactly is what ended up happening we got to take it right back to the beginning so here is taurus in the beginning and now that we know that isaiah and him him confirming in matthew and being able to confirm it and reveal it in luke in order in all of these revelations it's so crazy what is two months later so if this is jesus's birth and in the beginning this was the beginning but now or sorry this is the beginning now and this is the third month, which was Jesus' actual birth in the third month. But in the end of days, it's got to be brought back to the truth. What do we find out? That if this is Jesus' birth, but he never fulfilled Isaiah till two months later, then that means he's not coming back till here. Which is exactly what? Two months later. The ninth of the eighth of Av, and what happens? Pre-trib wedding for seven days. The Son of Man returning on the eighth day to begin his forty. How do we know that this is really the one and it's not really up here? Well, what I would suggest in this mid-June time frame, we are on guard like crazy. We're on guard every day, man. We are so close. But we are on guard like crazy here. But how do we know this? <clears throat> how have I been able to prove, even though I just showed you, there was two months too fast, two months has to be made up for, and Scripture reveals how it was made up for by showing, saying it was Jesus' birthday, but when Jesus actually fulfilled it, it was two months after his birthday. And it just so happens that when you track that out at the beginning of the 50 days, when the 50 days come to an end at the 29th of Elul, it's the day and hour no one knows. The exact time peace is taken from the earth and the 14 years begin with the attack on Jerusalem. That destroy it, scatter them, and World War III and everything then begins. But did you catch something else? I want to make sure you guys saw this part. Remember what it said here? So it was in the third month, came to the well of oath. It was on the seventh day of the month. Then Jacob remembered his dream and he stayed and he pondered it, remained there seven more days. Okay? There's to the 14th. And he might see a vision whether he should go down. And he celebrated the harvest festival of first fruits of old grain. That's, that's the Leia. That's the wedding. Which means what? The wedding takes place on the 15th day. Okay? Now, here's the thing. I want you guys to catch this. He remained seven days. Okay? And then observed the first fruits of the grain with the old wheat. What are we talking about here? If we just stuck with the third month, where it is now because of the sun's movement, there's the seventh day of the month. Then he had what? That's really your seventh Sabbath, right? In the count for your feast of weeks, if you count all the way back from Nisan. And then this would have been what jesus's birthday the 15th of savan is jesus's birthday but according to what this said this is also when he observes right it's the feast of weeks Th this would be where the quote-unquote wedding would be because it's the feast of weeks see it's the first fruits with old grain but what happens there's a wedding week remember don't you recall there's also a wedding week? <clears throat> like Rachel and Leah. This, this goes so much, guys. Why is this so important? Because look what happens. We know the story. Look at this. this the, the well of the mouth and, and Rachel was there and all of this, right? We know that. And then what does it say? In verse 16, Genesis 29, And Laban had two daughters. The name of the older, the name what? Of the 
older, representing the old grain, the winter wheat that goes first, was Leah. And the name of the younger, which is the new wheat, spring wheat, goes later. And what does it say? Leah was tender-eyed, and he says, uh, And Jacob loved Rachel and said, I will serve thee seven years for, thy, for Rachel, thy younger daughter. And what does he say? Verse 20, And Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed unto him but a few days for the love that he had for her fulfills her days and what happens the father-in-law makes a feast i have fulfilled my days we know that those days are the seven years that flew by like the the days represented for the that that luke group that pre-trib and the wedding that's coming so they were seven years but he didn't get anything at the beginning it's the spirit that's been working to wake up the bride for the last seven years. And 50 days before the seven years are done, that's when the bride goes. But listen to what's happening. This feast, we know it's a one-week, we call it a one-week wedding, right? <laughs> we call it a one-week wedding. Wait till you see where this is, how it perfectly lands. We know it's a one-week quote-unquote wedding. But the Feast of Weeks itself is only one single day, right? And so what happens? He fulfills her week. They Seven years flew by like days. He says, I fulfilled my time. Let me go in unto, unto her. And his father-in-law makes a feast. They makes a feast. He comes out. He's like, oh, man, you duped me, right? You beguiled me. And he says, no, no, no. You wanted the younger. But in my country, I can't give the younger before the firstborn. The, the older, the winter wheat, as you guys all know, had to go first. That is the pre-trib picture of the Gentile bride. And then what do we find out? Fulfill her week. Fulfill her week, which is seven days. But the week is also Shabua, which is the feast of of weeks the feast of weeks is only a single day for which jesus himself was born at the feast of weeks right on the 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 way the sun is playing out on the earth jesus was born on the feast of weeks right that or in the 15th to the 16th so what what ends up happening if everything is two months off and Jacob does seven days and it's called fulfill her week and we know it's off by two months, we've been able to prove it out. We know that two months had to be made up for and scriptures revealed it to us. Then what do we get? Fulfill her week. So the pre-trib escape happens at the end of the seventh Sabbath. And what do you get? There's your fulfill her week. But where's the wedding? Is the wedding the entire week? Or is the wedding one single day? The wedding would have to be the feast of weeks. Because the fulfill her week is a one week thing, right? It is Shabuah. It means the feast of weeks. But the event itself of the Feast of Weeks is a single day. Remember, we go to Deuteronomy, uh, Deuteronomy 16. We talk about this, right? The seven years of seals are, are the unleavened bread. The seven years of trumpet judgments are, are Feast of Booths. But the Feast of Weeks is a single day. It's one day day so what are we what am i getting at 15th of savan okay there's your seventh sabbath if it was the way it is right now but the lord made up the lord revealed as well the making up of the two months for the sun going off 
to keep everything in his standard position, which began in Taurus from in the beginning. Here's your seven days for which Messiah will then come on the eighth day. And this is your wedding day. You see, that is the true feast of weeks. So the bride is going for the wedding week, which is this is where it would appear to be at the end of the seventh Sabbath, making the seventh day the feast of weeks because the feast of weeks isn't a week long. It's one day long. Now, like I just said, we know it's been accounted for for the two months, which means this is the end of the seventh Sabbath. The bride is taken and it is fulfill her week. But within this fulfilling of her week, just like he does in remain seven days, then celebrates with old grain, which is the actual wedding itself. Look at where it falls, brothers and sisters. Look at where it falls. Understanding what I'm telling you, nothing has changed in what we've been talking about. All as I'm saying is that this is certainly all ears perked, ready, and watching. From right here, from mid-June. But the reality still hasn't changed that the Lord has already revealed this two months had to be made up for, and it was revealed from Isaiah. It was revealed into Matthew, and when he fulfilled it in the is, and we've shown the revelation of what it is in the is to come, and we can show it in connection to Jesus' birth, to when John was actually cast into prison two months later, showing us prophetically that Jesus didn't show up till about this time. So guess what? There's the week. And what happens at the end of that week? It's the actual Feast of Weeks, which would mean just as Jesus was born, where it would appear to be now, but the truth in the heavens is that this is where it is two months later. This is Jesus' actual birthday, right? Right here in this time, which means this is the Feast of Weeks. And what is it? The Jewish holiday of love. As a minor Jewish holiday in modern day Israel, it is celebrated as a holiday for love. It has been said to be an auspicious day for weddings. Hello. If this is the Feast of Weeks and it is a seven day period well this is the seventh sabbath which makes this the seven days this being the feast of weeks and revealed here that it obviously is the feast of weeks because the feast of weeks isn't the seven days it's the final day and it's related to when jesus was born and then look what happens the 16th the lord appeared which means Here's the Lord appearing on the 16th when he returns as the Son of Man to begin the 40 days as the white horse rider. This is probably like a six-day banquet and then the big wedding because the wedding itself will be on the date of the Feast of Weeks and then the Lord shows up. That's why I say Jesus born on the 15th, 16th, of the third month and why why have I said that in the past because Jesus in the beginning the word beginning is the feast of first fruits the feast of first fruits is what the feast of first fruits is the 16th day right of the third month you have Passover feast of first fruits is the resurrection so Jesus comes at the resurrection. <clears throat> we know the resurrection was on the 16th day of the first month, which means where the sun has gone off by two months, it would be right here early in the morning on the 16th day. There's the resurrection of Christ. Feast of first fruits, the feast of first fruits. Okay. That's where they have it now. 
which is what we would call the beginning. However, back at creation, this was the beginning. So to say the 15th to the 16th is a picture of Jesus was born because Feast of Weeks and creation, they're, they're right together. In the beginning, that started in Taurus. When, when Leviticus, Excuse me, when Leviticus was written, when God gave the law to Moses, it was all in Taurus. Taurus was the beginning of the year. So for the Lord to make up for all those thousands of years of the sun going off course, he gave us the scripture and we've been revealed the understanding of it to show the difference of those two months. And now we can add this detail of the literal day of wedding being the seventh day of the wedding feast and the wedding itself before the Lord returns to begin his 40 days of the Son of Man. You have to understand, it's not only the, the Isaiah and, and to the Matthew and understanding it from Luke and, and the timing of John and his imprisonment. It's the fact that the discourses and the weed harvest of winter followed by the weed harvest of spring, followed by the time of the harvest for grapes. And when you go into the discourses, realizing why Mark says at the end, when the Lord is coming in Mark's discourse, which is at the end of six years of seals to start the seventh, it's called the day and hour no one knows. And then you go to the end of 13 years of tribulation, to the end of the sixth year of trumpet, trumpets, which is Matthew's discourse, and it says it's the day and hour no one knows. Because it's the Feast of Trumpets. This is what I'm telling you guys. Is, is, it, is it high watch in, in June? Absolutely. But has it already been revealed? It has. It has. It's so crazy powerful. Even that the wedding is there. The, the Jewish wedding is on the seventh day like what almost like the lord kind of knew it <laughs> i say that tongue in cheek of course we know the lord knew it we come to find this adjustment we've known this we've talked about it now for over a year this understanding this finding of the two months seeking and searching it out understanding it with john only to then realize that the seventh day of the week wedding of the one week feast that he had to fulfill the wedding is the seventh day, is the final day. And it is the actual Feast of Weeks, which is the single day representation of the Feast of Weeks. It's incredible. It's awesome. And it's literally the count that gave us from Taurus. So we follow that count from Taurus, right? We follow that count from Taurus. That was the revelation of, right? The left eye of Taurus, Jesus, and the right eye of Taurus. There's Taurus, one, the beginning. There's him coming on the 16th, and the 14 represented by 50. It was to reveal and to confirm and for us to seek and to search out the understanding that there was this sun and the moon, but in particular the sun, that had gone off by two months. Had we never understood the, the revelation of the sun being off by two months. It was all because of this revelation through Numbers 13 of what happens here with Ephraim and Hosea, who is, who is Jesus, Yeshua, which is the direct typology which leads us to Messiah ben Joseph, who is the, the Messiah ben Ephraim, if you want. It's the same thing. It is Joshua, Yeshua, Jesus, and it is a representation of him coming at the end of the sixth year of seals. And to understand it and follow it back is what revealed Taurus was the beginning because I had no idea that that was the truth of the beginning, that it was in Taurus. Without that revelation, we could have never understood that what we weren't looking for wasn't really here. And then recall, the harvest helped us to understand it. There is no way you're going to begin to put the sickle to wheat in, 
in March, April. There is no such thing as wheat ready to be harvested in March, April because the seven Sabbaths for the count to the seventh Sabbath of the Feast of Weeks is for wheat. You know, when we've broken all that down, it's fantastic to understand it. This is actually the period when the sickle is put to winter wheat, to the older that goes first. And all of it, ta it, it all takes us back to Genesis, to Leviticus, to Exodus, when Taurus was the beginning. And so if all we do is follow the law, follow what the scripture revealed in the law, and begin with a Taurus count, Taurus as the beginning of the year. We know it's not as we have to live it on the earth, but biblically in the heavens, from heaven, this is the beginning. So if you follow the law with Taurus now being Savan, and you follow this as the beginning, you end up exactly to the end of winter wheat harvest. You end up exactly to the seven-day feast for which the Feast of Weeks is the wedding and exactly the time of being made up for the two months that Christ fulfilled from Isaiah to Matthew when John was then in prison, which then prophetically reveals the final 50 days that take us to the 29th of Elul and the beginning of the 14 years on the day and hour no one knows. Shut the front door. There was a lot. There's details in there, man. You've, you've got to take the time to seek and search them out and, and ask questions if you want. We can go into it. We've got so many variations and, and teachings from different angles showing this. But it is absolutely there. It's so incredible. So incredible. What a revelation all of this was. And the fulfill her week. But the event itself is on one day. The day of weddings. Craziness. So, now what happens? Now let's go into, as we were talking about, right? We're following this sand of the sea. Okay? As, as plenteous as the sand of the sea, which is relation to, to the Rachel, right? We're talking about the mid-trip. Genesis 41, 49. And Joseph gathered in that seventh year, right? Gathered the wheat as the sand of the sea, which was without number. Well, if, if Leah was the first one, so we just went off a, a little divergent trail to go back to the very beginning of everything. But our focus in all of this is is to the middle the the great multitude rapture which is the younger now which represents the rachel wheat okay when when rachel will also come in rachel is not the sand of the sea but it is when she comes in it is when her portion is also fulfilled you're gonna see it okay so we're seeing this in relation to the sand of the sea, Joseph, who is a picture of Messiah ben Joseph or Jesus or Messiah ben Ephraim, right? Ephraim being his firstborn. So now we follow this through and you guys will remember this. Jeremiah chapter 31. Watch what happens. Jeremiah 31, great piece of scripture. We've shared on it a number of times over the years from chapter 8. Behold, I will bring them from the north country and gather them from the coasts of the earth and with them the blind and the lame, the woman with child and her uh, that travail, travaileth with child together a great multitude, okay, shall return thither. We've shown you guys, this was shared from a sister a few years ago, that when you go to the Septuagint, it says, in Jeremiah 38, verse 8, the original translation, Behold, I will bring them from the north. I will gather them from the end of the earth. Listen to this. To the feast of Passover. 
The people shall be a great multitude. A great multitude at the feast of Passover. What? A great multitude at the feast of Passover? Isn't that exactly what we keep sharing, right? Those of you that have been listening for a while, that's no big deal. You guys already know this. So we know that the Rachel, the, the younger, the one is represented also as that wheat. Okay? When she comes in, yes, it's the great multitude, but Rachel will also be part of it. And what happens when they come in? Well, they're going to come in at the fall. Spring wheat is harvested in the fall. But remember the Ezekiel 39 war that happens, and there's going to be this burying of the bones. So the great multitude rapture won't officially be observed until Middish seals, which from the Feast of Trumpets is either Passover or second Passover. Christ already fulfilled Passover, so maybe it'll be second Passover, hence the seven months of burying bones. But he's going to gather them in and bring them together. And by the time they all come in, who is this that's coming in? It's the ten tribes. It's the ten tribes. He's going to deal with destroying all the enemies, the Ezekiel 39 war. they got to bury bones for seven months. And as this peaceable group comes, they're the ten tribes, as we saw, which were led by Joseph, who is a picture of Christ. They were led away by the time in, in, in the days of King Hosea, which prophetically is whoever that king will be at the in the time in the is to come. And listen to what verse 9 then says. Uh, then shall come, uh, they shall come with weeping and with supplication. Will I lead them? I will cause them to walk by the rivers of waters in a straight way wherein they shall not stumble. For I am <clears throat> a father to Israel and Ephraim is my firstborn. Joseph, Ephraim, firstborn. Jesus, Messiah ben Joseph through Messiah ben Ephraim. Father being Noon, who is perpetuity, who is forever. Hear the word of the Lord, O you nations, and declare it in the isles afar off, and say, He that scattered Israel will gather him and keep him as a shepherd does his flock. Remember I told you to remember that earlier? <coughs> as a shepherd does his flock. But John, in John 10, like mid seals, he, he's saying, yeah, he, he is the shepherd of a flock, but he, he's got another flock of sheep that he still has to bring in as well, right? We know that it's it's Zerubbabel, the, the Messiah ben David, who's going to help with that one as well. Where, where are these guys going? So if this is the great multitude rapture, and he's going to gather all of them that were scattered from the coast of the earth, where is he gathering them? Well, let's go to verse 12. Therefore shall they come and sing in the height of Zion. Well, wait a second, what? The Lord's coming on Mount Zion. He's coming with the place prepared and built. What is this place prepared and built he's coming on? We know it from John 14. And John 14, which of course we know in the chapters to years, John 14 is the exact same time, the seventh year of seals, when he's coming for the place, he's coming with the place prepared and built, as he said he would. I, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, listen to this. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. He's coming. He's coming to receive you to this place prepared. And what is this place prepared? You guys know it. Of course you do. Second Corinthians chapter 12. Mount Zion, the place prepared is paradise. It's paradise. The first group is the group in Christ, pre-trib, Luke, Gentile bride in Christ, going above 14 years, the 50 days, then the 14 years, right? That's them. They're going to the third heaven. Then you have another group, not quite in Christ like the first group was, 
but believe in Christ, they will be part of the great multitude rapture, the was caught up, and they're going to paradise, which is the place prepared that has many mansions. It's the place prepared with many mansions. So, what do we know about this? It's the height of Zion. Right? They're going up to Zion. Mount Zion. Jeremiah 31 again. They're going up to the place prepared, Mount Zion, where there's many places built, many homes for them, gathering them back. And listen to what it says. Again, Jeremiah 31, 12. Therefore shall they come and sing in the heights of Zion and shall flow together to the goodness of the Lord for wheat and for wine and for oil and for the younger of the flock and for the herd and their souls shall be as a watered garden as a watered garden because what they're going to paradise they're going to be in the garden the place that the lord is coming from it is coming with heavenly mount zion the the stone that becomes a great mountain and they shall not sorrow anymore what time is it for wheat and for wine for wheat and for wine and they won't sorrow anymore revelation chapter 7 i beheld a great multitude there's your great multitude which no man can number a great multitude which no man can number what are we talking about gathering the corn as the sand to sea couldn't count it anymore for it was without number what are they representing the old wheat they're rep or sorry sorry the new wheat they're representing the rachel and this group that comes in in relation to the ten tribes it's it's the seventh year of seals the group without number and it's the great multitude just as jeremiah 31 just said here it is in the seventh year of seals and what does he tell them? They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them for any heat. Living waters are going to be led by the Lord, tears wiped away. And they're the great multitude. It's precisely what he's talking about. But what else is it? It's not only the wheat there, but there's also going to be wine. There's going to be the wheat and the wine. Well, in the timing of the wheat and the wine, I think you guys know it, right? When I was showing you guys over here is that this end of the year is the what? Right? From, you could say, real late August, but really September into mid-October is what? Well, it's when spring wheat is harvested in the fall. And spring wheat is the Rachel one that we're talking about, right? Well, what else comes in the fall at that time? What else is harvested in the fall? Grapes. Harvest time usually takes place towards the end of summer or early fall, September to October. It's, it's the same everywhere. At the turn of fall, maybe end of August into mid-October. There's no such thing as grapes being ready to harvest for pentecost like people would think all the way back in june it doesn't exist so when do we know the great multitude rapture is going to take place it's going to begin in the fall but there's going to be the seven months you see the seven months of bearing the bones and of gathering them in and they are the ten tribes but it's not only the ten tribes because you remember from Jeremiah 31, what ends up happening? We see here, Then shall the virgin rejoice and dance, both young men old together, for I will turn their mourning. So this is all about the, the, the ten tribes in the great multitude rapture, the Gentiles, that the, the flock from Luke 21, uh, sorry, sorry, from John 21, the, the, the first set of, of uh, sheep, it went lambs pre-trib, and then it was sheep, right? The first sheep of the two. And what do you see? 
it relates to the shepherd and his flock. But remember, there's that other flock that he's going to bring in, right? And listen to what this says. We've got the wine and the wheat. There they are in the garden. It's a great multitude that happens. And listen to verse 5. Uh, sorry, 15. Jeremiah 31, 15. Thus saith the Lord, a voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel, weeping for her children, refused to be comforted for her children because they were not. Wait a second. Rachel weeping because her children didn't go? We know Joseph is, is one of her children, but Joseph was already in that other land, so this is connected to the ten brethren in relation to the great, ma uh, um, the great multitude rapture of the wheat. But who wasn't there? Benjamin. Benjamin was still held back. So you've got events still going on with Benjamin and Joseph. And we have what? Rachel weeping after the picture, this prophetic type of the picture of the great multitude rapture. But what does he tell her? In verse 16, so she's weeping because her children aren't there. And we see in the same typology of Joseph and the ten tribes going that Benjamin is held back. And Benjamin is Rachel's. And so is Joseph. And then in verse 16, Jeremiah 31, Thus saith the Lord, Refrain thy voice from weeping, and thine eyes from tears, for thy work shall be rewarded, saith the Lord, and they shall come again from the land of the enemy. There is hope in thine end, saith the Lord, that thy children shall come again to their own border. You see, now they're still going to be they're going to be coming too, And we know that they come after the great multitude rapture in the seventh year of seals. Still, we come down to Jeremiah 31 and 31, and it's talking about the new covenant, which is exactly what happens towards the end of the seventh year of seals when the Lord now makes a covenant with all nations. And it says in 31, 31, behold, the days come, saith the Lord that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, listen to this, and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. Remember, they all came out. Which my covenant they break, although I was a husband to them. So here we are. Now he's making a covenant with Israel and with Judah. Well, what did we see? We know that Messiah ben Joseph, who is Jesus, who is going to be high priest and king as, as the uh, uh, Ephraim, is going to be the one to cross them over. Who's going to cross them over into the promised land of the great multitude rapture as the sand of the sea is the wheat. They're the ten tribes. Just mo like Moses dying, right? And then Joshua, who is Ephraim, from Joseph crossed them over and then you had rachel weeping for her children for which who the messiah ben david who is the zerubbabel who will then be made known even though he was there during seals remember coming up from his place he was here he's a person on the earth he's going to come up from his place and when they're going to declare then this rebuilding of the temple as i stated in the beginning the jews who remain the, the Gentile age is over. The Jews will see again. They will recognize their Messiah because they have been waiting for their Messiah who is going to destroy their enemies who scattered them and then will declare the rebuilding of the temple which will then take place. And it is the Messiah Ben David. It is the Zerubbabel, the branch, who is going to be the one rebuilding while Messiah ben Joseph Jesus is the high priest and king. This is all at the end of seals. It doesn't get any more clear than this. It's right there. Look what happens. We get that great multitude rapture. It's 
It's, uh, you know, they're joyous now. They're all there. How can we show that it's also the house of Judah there? Well, Zechariah, right? Zechariah chapter 8. One that we know very well. Zechariah chapter 8, where's the Lord? Verse 2, thus saith the Lord of hosts, I was jealous for Zion with great jealousy. I was jealous for her with great, with great fury. Thus saith the Lord, I am returned unto Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem shall be called the city of truth and the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. We know he's coming on the mountain. It's all there. Because he's coming with the place prepared, which is paradise. It's so crystal clear as we keep going. It just gets deeper and, and more clearly revealed. It's, it's so incredible. Watch what happens. We go back to the wheat. Okay? We see the wheat. We understand it's all about the prophetic picture of the seventh year of seals. The, the younger that can now go because the older is already gone. The, the younger represents the mid-trib great multitude rapture in the seventh year of seals. And when I go and look in this word for corn, which is the word for wheat, as we showed earlier at the beginning, okay, from the storyline of this innumerable multitude, the sand of the sea without number, watch what happens. How can we prove this out through other places of Scripture we have come to understand? How about Joel chapter 2? For those that don't know, we've got a video. I think it's Joel in order or something like that as well. We show Joel chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3. It's the, it's the pre-40-day time frame, son of man. The, the Joel chapter 2 is the end of six years of seals to that seventh year of seals. And Joel chapter 3 is when the Lord returns feet down. All of it is there in order. Let me show you this. So we go to Joel chapter 2. Let's prove that this is the time of the end of seals. Joel chapter 2, again, in the same context of the wheat, in the same context of the mountain of the Lord that begins with blow the trumpet in Zion. At the end of six years, the beginning of the seventh year of seals is the Feast of Trumpets, the day and hour no one knows, and the trumpet is being blown in Mount Zion, the holy mountain of the Lord. This is the end of the sixth year of seals. And remember what I was talking about in this really crazy understanding of the statement of these things we've come to learn about the teacher of righteousness and and who, who it appears to be and, and what he's been given and, and how it's understood. We came to realize that in Joel chapter 2, it reveals that at the return of the Lord, at the end of six years of seals, to start that seventh year of seals, when he has destroyed the enemies of Ezekiel 39, wait till you see where this goes. Because it goes even deeper, showing the attacks that we have known in order. I'm going to be able to prove out to you that Ezekiel 39, as we have known for a long time, is the end of the sixth year battle, which is the ten horns, which is the first sword of the two swords that Luke 22 spoke about that we said earlier and have taught on before. I'm going to prove to you that it is the Messiah ben Joseph, the, the Ephraim, Jesus coming as high priest and king, who is going to destroy them here. And who he's going to destroy that will also prove Daniel chapter 7, as we've been talking about. That will prove the discourses of Luke, Mark, and Matthew in order where, where the Antichrist shows up and then where he's not. And then when he comes back again, we can show it from Revelation 17. When he was, is not, and shall be. I'm going to be able to prove it to you in the ancient writings. It's, it's wild. I'd never come across this stuff before. So. Remember what happens. This, this whole storyline that's taking place and, and the events talking about this teacher of righteousness that we found literally written in Joel chapter 2 at the end of it, which is at the great multitude rapture. In the seventh year seals, which means he is here, and in the story of this, this 
teacher of righteousness that was coming in the final generation, they believed that he wouldn't be here during portion of tribulation because they only understand seven years. But it shows and it talks about that he would be here until the Messiah ben Joseph and ben David are revealed, which means when Messiah ben Joseph comes to gather the ten tribes, the teacher of righteousness had to be here because it says that the Messiah ben Joseph takes over from him. I told you, it is so crazy. And then, and then what do we know about it? Well, we came to find out. We've known the story of Joel in order, chapter 1, 2, and 3. And the timings of it, we've known it for a few years before we knew anything about the teacher of righteousness. And then we came to find out that this term right here, in many other translations outside of the King James, instead of saying the former reign moderately, it says the teacher of righteousness. The teacher of righteousness. That's the translation that many other um, uh, translations use. And so just as it says about the, the those ancient writings with the teacher of righteousness, that he would be here until the end of seals, or they don't know it's at the end of seals, but until the two messiahs show up. And we know that the two messiahs don't show up until the end of the sixth year of seals. And the one is Joshua, Yeshua, Messiah. And the other one is Zerubbabel, who's going to rebuild the temple. And it says, and uh, the council will be between them both. The, the high priest king, Joshua, Jesus, who took them over is going to be the high priest and king, the one overseeing everything. He is going to be the one with the 144, hence Revelation chapter 14, and the 144 standing on Mount Zion with the Lamb, because he had returned on heavenly Mount Zion, gathered the 144 who will go out and teach, who evangelize during the time of the first half of trumpets at least. And so the branch we know is Zerubbabel, who is going to be the one who had laid the foundation during seals, and then we'll build the temple during trumpets, which is why he's the one who brings in the, the Judah portion because they have been waiting for a conquering king and the rebuilt temple to be declared. We know it's the end of the sixth year of seals, which is the beginning of the seventh year. But he's going to be seen coming at the end of the sixth year of seals. So here we are, Feast of Trumpets, Holy Mountain, the seventh year of seals is beginning. It's the return of the Lord at this time. And it says in Joel 2.23, Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you. So the Father has given you the teacher of righteousness. And he will cause to come down, which is to have Jesus come down for you, the rain. The former rain come and the latter rain in the first month. That's Jesus. The teacher of righteousness first. Moderately, he came down. He doesn't know everything. And then Jesus is going to be the one that comes down and takes over. And it's exactly what it talks about when it goes into these details and all of this crazy stuff with the teacher of righteousness and how he knows and how he understands these things. Now, listen to verse 24 and how this ties into what we're talking about. 224, the floors shall be full of wheat the same wheat not that other 76 6, 8, whatever it is but the actual same wheat that joseph is talking about in the seventh year and it's what and the vats shall be overflowing with wine and oil and i will restore to you the years it's the exact same thing Oh my goodness, it's like 11.30 at night. My neighbors, because I do this in the garage and my garage door is propped open, they must be closing their windows at this point. <laughs> Good thing tomorrow's a holiday. So what are you seeing? You're seeing at the end of six years, if it all begins this year at the Feast of Trumpets, then six years later, in what? Let's see what it said. Six years later, which would be Feast of Trumpets, 2030. Just as Jesus was 30, Joseph 30, Feast of Trumpets 2030, it would be on the day and hour, no one knows that this is all beginning. And it's exactly what? It's the time of 
the spring wheat harvest? When all the wheat is being gathered in? And all the what? The grape harvest? Man, it's so crazy. Tracking these things, following these things, seeing how it's all connected, it's, it's, it boggles the mind. It stretches everything we anybody ever thought they had understood about prophecy. But it said in the time of the end, the books would be opened. They are opening, brothers and sisters. They've been opening for almost seven years. We won't know everything. But more than it has ever been revealed in prophetic history that even the, the, the prophets themselves knew was in their writings that they didn't yet understand. It is absolutely happening. And you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. And that I am the Lord your God and none else. And my people shall never be ashamed. So we know again that they're now both going to be there, right? So, we know that the, the house of Israel and then the house of Judah after the house of Israel and they get both come in and remember because it's going to connect as we keep going to the two sheepfolds, right? Because the two sheepfolds are going to become one with one head, right? One shepherd. So now watch what happens. We follow the same storyline, Revelation 7, and this is what I was talking about earlier. I got a little bit ahead of myself going to it, but it still ties into what we're talking about. It says, we're now in Luke chapter 3, and just like we have a, a, a video and teachings on, on uh, Joel in order, we also have the fantastic teaching that we recently taught on in part, but we've got a teaching of Luke in order, chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, and what do we know about chapter 3? Chapter 3 is prophetically weaved into it as the end also, as the picture of the end of the sixth year of seals or the seventh year of seals. And look at what we see. Whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and will gather the wheat. And will gather the wheat. What were we just talking about with Joel? The floors will be full of wheat. Why full of wheat? Because it's the great multitude. It is the wheat that is without number. It's the great multitude rapture of the seventh year of seals, the Lord having come at the end of six years to start that seventh year. And what do we know the connection was to the exact storyline of Joseph? You got it. Jesus being about Jesus beginning to be 30 years of age, who was supposed to be the son of Joseph. <laughs> the entire story is a weaved parallel from the was, the is that revealed the is to come, piecing it all together. These mysteries just just weaved all together throughout the entirety of Scripture. It just never, ever stops. It just keeps going. Watch what happens here now. We go back to the sand of the sea. Remember I said we would go back to Hosea? Hosea chapter 1, verse 10. Now we go back into Hosea chapter 1, verse 10. And let's see how this is directly connected to what we've been talking about. Like the beginning of the 14 years, right? The beginning of the 14 years. And look at what it says. Remember the... The beginning, let me say that again, the beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea. Hosea is what? Yeshua, the deliverer. <laughs> and the Lord Father said unto Hosea, go take thee a wife of whoredom. Go get your what? Your adulterous wife? It doesn't actually mean adultery. It just means your Gentile bride, right? Gentiles are also dogs. Go get your Gentile bride. Now, when the Gentile bride is gone, who do you think is left? The rest of the house, right? The ten tribes, the house of Israel. Those who will be as what? The sand of the sea. Look at this. Hosea chapter 1, verse 10. We're now, the seals, the tribulation is beginning yet, right? 14 chapters. And it says, yet the number of the children 
of Israel shall be as the sand of when yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea which cannot be measured nor numbered and it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them you are not my people there it shall be said unto them you are the sons of the living God listen to this then shall the children of Judah and the children of Israel be gathered together and appoint themselves one head hello you see where that all led to Jesus told us when he told them other sheep I have which are not of this fold which are not of what fold which are not of the fold during seals the house of Israel that he's that he's really working on during the time of tribulation of seals he's got another group which is Judah that's going to come in after this fold but the focus the real focus still during seals is the house of Israel to bring back the ten tribes but he's got another fold and when he gets these folds then it'll be what they will be one fold and have one shepherd which means if he is the shepherd but he is also we know he is the lamb then that means when we saw in John 21 when he said feed my lambs feed uh, feed my sheep feed my sheep the lambs was all about the the pre-trib everybody pre-trib bride who are like Christ who are co-heirs with Christ who will be in the third heaven in Christ spirit filled and the lamb and the sheep that he had to feed and the sheep that he had to feed are clearly the house of Israel and the house of Judah that will become one with one shepherd it's right there they will become one with one shepherd and when do we know it happens it happens at the end of seals the house of Israel come in first then Judah follow after them and they will be together and appoint to themselves one head clearly showing the house of Judah is one of the sheepfold and the house of Israel is the other but the house of Judah cannot come in before the house of Israel and we have proven and we've shown that they do not come in before the house of Israel the great multitude rapture hence again going into Zechariah 8 being the beginning of the seven years of trumpet judgments we know that the temple is now going to start to get rebuilt seals is now over the Lord made a covenant just like he said he would in Jeremiah 31 that we shared now he's going to make a covenant and he's going to make a covenant with all nations he's now got the house of Israel back the the Gentiles grafted in they're gone to paradise and the rest are all there in Jerusalem and it says let your hands be strong you that hear in these days the words by the mouth of the prophets which were in the day that the foundation of the house of the Lord of hosts was laid that means there's gonna be prophets during the time of seals because the foundation is being laid during seals so that what so that the temple might be built one of my favorite verses for before these days there was no man for hire nor any beast neither was there any peace to him that went out uh, or came in because of the affliction for I set everyone against his neighbor nation against nation kingdom against kingdom that that is the seven the the six portion years of seals and then it says but now I will not be unto the residue of this people as in the former days um for the seed is prosperous the vine hath given her fruit and has grown to the increase now here it comes verse 13 and it shall come to pass that as you were a curse among the heathen O house of Judah and house of Israel see among the heathen they hate Jews and they hate Christians right O house of Judah and house of Israel there they are there they are again they're both there proving that by the end of seals both are now together 
you know, the great multitude went, but also Judah came in. Okay, now what's left? Now there's going to be like corners and gleaning and stuff still remaining in the earth. And it says, so will I save you and you shall be a blessing. Fear not, but let your hands be strong. You see, because now they're going to start rebuilding. There's no more fasting and mourning for the house of Judah, but joy and gladness. That's exactly, it goes back to showing that the Messiah ben Joseph, Jesus, high priest and king, Joshua, Ephraim type, brings them in. The ten tribes, the, the house of Israel, the ones who he came for, and then Messiah ben David, with what he does in the rebuilding, is the one that, that, that makes them aware of this is now finally happening. The enemies have been destroyed that scattered us, and now we're going to be brought back. Our enemies were destroyed, and the temple is now going to get rebuilt. Exactly as they have understood. That's why the Jews are blinded for us. Until the great multitude comes in. Now check this out. We're bringing this to an end. This is one little piece our brother Clive shared with this shared this with me. Oh, maybe a couple few weeks ago now. It's just a little clip. We're going to listen to it. I don't even know if that's what, a minute? Not even a minute. But I want you to listen very carefully. If you need to, rewind it again. But this is a Messianic rabbi. And he goes into what these words and these things mean. I want you to pay very close attention. It's what we've revealed. And this is, now we're going, now we're going towards the, the tail end as the story continues into trumpets. But listen to this, because it is, this part here is going right towards that, that end part of trumpets. Listen to what he says. Make sure I've got the speed down. Okay, listen to this. About the aspect of my sheaf arose, kama alumati. This idea is hinted at the word nofelet with the vav, which is equal to Mashiach ben Yosef, gematria. Okay, let's do this again. This is so shocking. In that day, when Mashiach ben Yosef is resurrected as the Mashiach ben David. <laughs> Wait, did, let me play that again. You can go in and, and listen to it yourselves to get this, this full context of what's being said, okay? It's Bet Har Derek. It's this video right here, May 11th, 2024. He's talking about how the understanding of this wording in Scripture is actually the wording for Messiah ben Joseph. When my sheaf rose, this, this Hebrew translation is the actual understanding of the Messiah ben Joseph. Okay? Listen to what, what he says. About the aspect of my sheaf arose. Kama alumati. This idea is hinted at the word nofelet with the vav, which is equal to Mashiach ben Yosef, gematria. Okay, let's do this again. So it represents the Mashiach ben Joseph, Messiah ben Joseph, the Messiah ben Ephraim, Joshua that we're talking about. And listen to what he says next. This is so shocking. In that day when Mashiach ben Yosef is resurrected as the Mashiach. In that day when Mashiach Ben Joseph is resurrected. Jack ben David. Did you hear that? Then the messianic line dare not start afresh. Its resurrection symbolizes listen, listen, listen continuity. Fell it with the vav, which Here is equal to Mashiach ben Yosef, gematria. Okay, let's do this again. This is so shocking. In that day when Mashiach ben Yosef is resurrected as the Mashiach ben David. In that day. When the Mashiach ben Joseph is resurrected as Messiah ben David. What? Wait a second. I thought there, there is a Messiah ben Joseph and a Messiah ben David. I thought, I thought the Messiah ben Joseph is Yeshua Jesus. Joshua, Yeshua, yes, he is. He's high priest and king at the end of the six years of seals. He's coming with heavenly Mount Zion, with paradise. He's going to destroy the enemies in the Ezekiel 39 war, which I'm going to get to in a moment, in incredible revelation from ancient writings. And the Messiah ben David, who is who? 
Well, the Messiah Ben David at that point is the branch. This modern day Zerubbabel, who will be who is here now, and who will be the one during seals who will implement, who will get them to go back and bring a people back a portion to allow them to start to rebuild, but they will only get the foundation built during seals when the Antichrist and everything in chaos then breaks out by Middish seals. <coughs> Excuse me. So they won't actually build anything more than the foundation during seals. And as we just showed, now during the beginning of trumpet judgments, when he will officially become the, the Messiah Ben David, the anointed one, not as the Messiah, but as an anointed Messiah David type who is going to be the one over charge over, over the rebuilding of the temple itself, which he laid the foundation of in seals with those that he brought back to do it. But the Messiah, Jesus, Yeshua Messiah, is the Ben Joseph one. <clears throat> this is an anointed one, like, um, like Cyrus was called a Messiah type because he is anointed. This is the anointed Ben David. But what you just heard was that Messiah Ben Joseph is going to be killed. <coughs> Excuse me. And when he is resurrected, he will be resurrected as the Messiah Ben David. Not just an anointed one, but the Messiah Ben David. You think, well, how on earth can that be? We already knew it. We've already taught it. Do you guys remember this? We've taught about this, the layout of, of the of the of the temple in the wilderness. You have the lion, the man, the ox, the eagle. And this was added by our sister. I'll go through this outer pointing and arrow stuff. We taught about this a few months ago. And our sister Tammy, who did the, the new timeline chart with all the details, she did this for us as well. What have we taught about this? The lion of the tribe of Judah is the timing of the escape of the bride, okay? So if we go to Revelation chapter 5, look at who it starts with, right? John opens, a, John sees it, and nobody can open it. He's panicking, oh, no. And then in Revelation 5, 5, and one of the elders saith unto me, weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. Well, that's Jesus. So we know he's of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, but he's also what? He's also the root of Joseph. He's, he's got a dual part that he's playing. We already know this. This is what we've been showing through the entire thing of the Messiah Ben Joseph and Joseph leading the ten. But it starts tribulation. Who's the first one that can open? It's, it's the lion. And before the lion opens, what happens? Well, you have, a, you have the, the, the group in heaven. The, the pre-trib is there. There's your 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. The, the Gentile believers and the Jewish believers, which I believe represent 144 million people of the, of the Gentiles, of the, of the house Israel Gentile group, if you will that the pre-trib will be 144 million people. And who's here at that point? It's the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. So what are we seeing? What am I drawing here in this picture? The pre-trib escape at the beginning of the 50 days, when the seventh Sabbath ends and the pre-trib goes, it's connected to the east. It's connected to the east, the lion of the tribe of Judah. You have your seven-day wedding, quote-unquote, your feast, and on the seventh day, now that we're seeing it, is the actual wedding itself. And then what happens? Well, then the Son of Man, right? Then the Son of Man, the white horse rider, <clears throat> directly related to the south, Reuben, who is man, is the 40 days of the Son of Man, the white horse rider, which is the discourse of Luke where he's going to be warning them as he said he would, as Jonah did. And when the 40 days are over, he's going to leave. And the group from the Luke group of remnant workers who are the remainder of the bride chosen to remain to work 
followed him for 40 days, had a banquet meal with him after the wedding because they didn't go. They were waiting for his return after the wedding. He has a banquet meal with them. He opens their understanding and they're going to follow him, do these things, learn, and they're going to be filled with incredible revelation, even more than what is already started. And then the Lord goes at the end of 40 days, just like he did last time. He will go up, and then what happens? They will wait not many days from now, three days. They'll be anointed at the true feast of uh, um, the fruit, the true Pentecost, which we call Acts 2.0, which would be the 29th of Elul. And then what? They go out from Jerusalem. And when they go out from Jerusalem, bang, Jerusalem is destroyed, and the 14 years begin. The seals of the second red horse rider, the second seal, red horse rider, begins at the, at the destruction of Jerusalem, which is nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Just as we've showed in the Apocrypha, as we showed in the, in the scriptures. And then what happens? The Lord, who is the ox, who is what? Yeah, you guessed it. Ephraim, when he comes at the end of the sixth year to start that seventh year of seals, he is coming as Messiah ben Joseph or Ephraim. Ephraim is what? The ox, the bull. And you've got the olive branch represented by arrows. You see, I didn't make this, guys. This is done by, by scholars and other people from text that I found it. And you've got the olive branch in Numbers 13. This is the end of the sixth year to the start of the seventh year of seals. And who are we waiting for? Messiah ben Joseph, right? Messiah ben Ephraim, my firstborn. He is the ox, the bull. And he is the what? The olive branch. Remember those who are grafted in? Why did I show you in relation to Numbers 13 and the revelation of it? Because, jo uh, um, because Ephraim, who uh, Osi, who is from the tribe of Ephraim, whose father is Nun, is Hosea the deliverer? Is Hosea. And what happens towards the end is he's no longer O.C. Hosea, which is the when the 14 years begin, go get your bride. But Moses changes his name from O.C. to Joshua. Because his picture at the end of the sixth year of seals is him coming as Joshua Yeshua. As the high priest and king, as the as the Ephraim Messiah ben Joseph. You see, remember even in the in the uh, in Second Ezra's when I was saying, see the ten tribes which were led away in the captivity in the time of King Hosea. That's why when you see this with King Hosea, and we go back into the book of Hosea, there's your fourteen years. In chapters to years for the Hosea group starts with the the ten tribe bride right the pre-trib bride and then it talks about all them who will be coming later and it's those from what from the book of Hosea it's craziness where was I where was I oh yeah from numbers 13 from the picture there we go so here we now have exactly at the time when Ephraim shows up and and we have the branch. Remember, the olive branch, there's the wild olive branch that is grafted into the natural. That's the Gentiles grafted in. There's the olive branch. And when we go to Genesis, you guys that have been around for a while, remember this. You go to Genesis chapter 8, when the seven days are done, a picture of the seven years, like the seventh year of seals. The, 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 the Holy Ghost goes out, the dove goes out, and returns with an olive branch. It says leaf, but the word also means branch. So right at the time of the end of seals, at the time of the great multitude rapture, Messiah ben Ephraim, the ox. Remember, the ox is the sacrifice that hasn't happened yet. With, there's three sacrifices in Leviticus chapter 1. There's one that has to take place for the priestly line, and it's an ox which means Messiah ben Joseph or Ephraim, who is the Messiah ben Joseph type. What did it say about him that we just heard in that video? That he's going to die. But when he resurrects, 
he's going to resurrect as Messiah Ben David. But he's starting at the end of seals. And when we got to the end of seals and the great multitude rapture happens, who wasn't there? Benjamin. <laughs> Man, I love it. I love it when the plan comes together after years of complete detail, detail, detail. So what happens now? Messiah ben Joseph, the Messiah ben Ephraim is here. The first half of trumpets are now taking place. And during the first half of trumpets, okay, the great multitude rapture came in. So the house of Israel is in. The house of Judah has come in. The, the Messiah ben Joseph, who is Jesus, and the anointed Messiah ben David, who is Zerubbabel, is here, right? And what's happening? The Zerubbabel type Messiah ben David, the anointed one, is taking care of the rebuilding of the temple during the first three and a half years of trumpets. While the Lord Yeshua, Jesus Messiah, Messiah ben Joseph ben Ephraim, is the, is the one leading the 144,000. He is the high priest and king over them. Then what happens? At mid-trumpets, well, wait a second, at the end of seals, what happens? The Antichrist was killed, right? It's the battle of Gog, and the Antichrist is killed. We've showed this. We'll touch on it briefly, but you're going to see why it's so powerful. That's why Antichrist is in here. That's why the Lord is here, and he made a covenant with nations. And the rebuilding of the city and the streets takes place, not by the Antichrist, but by the anointed Messiahs, by Messiah himself, and the anointed one of Zerubbabel, of which Zerubbabel is the one that's overseeing the rebuilding of it. And then what happens? Mid-trumpets. Trumpets comes. The eagle is now mid-trumpets. And what happens at mid-trumpets? Ten and a half years now into tribulation. Comes to the end of seals. Three and a half years of trumpets. The rebuilding of the city and the streets and the temple. What happens at mid-trumpets? They're going to have to fly away on the wings of an eagle. Because it's the fifth trumpet, and the fifth trumpet is the first woe, when what happens? When the pit is open, when Satan has been cast down, and look what happens. The serpent shows up. The serpent is there. And what happens? When the pit opens, the Antichrist comes back. So what did, what did we have in this? Um, In the, in the, about, Middish seals, Antichrist shows up on the scene as we showed before. So we got the is, uh, the 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 was. He's destroyed at the end of the sixth year of seals. He is not during the first half of trumpets. Satan is cast down. The pit is open. He comes back, and he shall be, which is the last three, the last half of the trumpet judgments, or from ten and a half to the end of the tribulation, which is fourteen years is three and a half years, he's going to get two and a half of those final three and a half years. Why is this so important? Because within this, Messiah ben Ephraim, Messiah ben Joseph, he has to be killed to be able to come back, feet down on the Mount of Olives as, olives as what? The Lion of the tribe of Judah. Who is the Lion of the tribe of Judah? But David, the lion of the tribe of Judah. And Ephraim, Messiah ben Ephraim, who is Christ, has to be killed before he can return, feet down, when the whole world will see him coming as Messiah ben David from the tribe of Judah. If you're new to this, this is going crazy too far for you. I get it. This is for those who have been studying and following these things for a while. It's insanity. And I'm going to prove these things to you, even from what he said. I start going and doing digging and, and searching out more about Messiah Ben Joseph. Watch this. I come across this, this stone tablet that has ink writing, it says. So it's called Gabriel's Revelation. Are you ready for this? I just found this today. Gabriel's Revelation is a stone tablet with its text written in ink. Although the inscription is in a poor state of preservation, the meaning of the legible text is still a matter of scholarship. The text 
st- uh, seems to talk about a messianic figure from Ephraim, listen to this, who will break evil before righteousness by the three days. Okay? So a Messiah bin David who will break evil. Okay? What did we say? When does that happen? We've showed Antichrist at about two and a half years into seals comes on the scene. He's got 42 months till the end of the sixth year of seals when Messiah bin Joseph, Messiah Ephraim shows up on the scene. What do we know he does? That'll be the first sword when he destroys the 10 kings. When he destroys the 10 kings and the beast. Right? The 10 horns and the beast. So here he is. Um, will break, uh, uh, who will break evil before righteousness by three days. Now listen to this. Later, the text talks about the prince of princes, a leader of Israel. That's still Messiah ben Joseph. This is Jesus. Remember in Daniel, where are we? Daniel chapter 9, Messiah the Prince. Okay? So what do we know has happened? At the end of the sixth year of seals, Messiah the Prince, right? Uh, uh, sorry, uh, um, the Antichrist has been killed. So he was, remember? And then the first half of trumpets, he is not. And then he shall be when he comes out of the pit at mid-trumpets. So what do we see here? There's your seven years of seals, the city and the streets and the wall and everything being rebuilt in the first half of trumpets. At the end of those three and a half weeks, it says what? Messiah shall be cut off. Okay? Not not this prince down here. This is Messiah himself. The actual anointed Messiah. This is the Messiah ben Joseph. Okay? The Messiah ben Ephraim. So what we're seeing here is that Messiah Jesus, Messiah Ephraim ben Joseph, kills the Antichrist. You're going to see it is the Antichrist. Kills the Antichrist. And then yet later in the text, it talks about the leader of Israel, who is the Messiah ben Ephraim still, the Messiah ben Joseph, the leader of Israel, who is killed by the evil king and not properly buried. Do I need to say anything to those of you who have been following for a bit? Do I need to say at all what that means? Antichrist was here. Messiah Ben Ephraim comes. He kills the, 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 the ten horns, right? The ten kings with the beast. The beast is not during the first half of trumpets. Satan is cast down. The, those that are saved already, they're going to fly away on the wings of an eagle till the end of the 14 years. And... The pit is open. War breaks out against who? The two messiahs. The anointed one and the messiah ben Joseph, Jesus. War breaks out for two and a half years against who? Against the beast when he shall come. And what does he do? He kills him. Remember messiah said that I will take my life and I could give it again and take it again? We even saw that in John 10. We see that in Matthew 17, that he could take it again. And what did it just say about him? That the leader will then be killed by this evil king and not properly buried. Not properly buried. Do you know of a place where we've revealed this? Where there are two of them as the two witnesses during trumpets when war breaks out against them? When the bottomless pit is open, because the Antichrist comes back, the evil one, who will then make war against them, it will last for two and a half years. And when it's done, do they get a proper burial? Or are they lying in the streets for three and a half days? Hello. This is written on ancient stone with some type of ink called the Gabriel's Revelation. And so, so you've got Ephraim at the end of seals who, who, who breaks and defeats the evil one. Then later in the text, the Messiah ben Ephraim, the leader, is killed by this evil king and he's not properly buried. The evil king is then miraculously defeated. 
That's when the Lord returns feet down on the Mount of Olives <laughs> as the Messiah Ben David when he's going to defeat him, which is the second battle when we see the second sword in Revelation 19 and the first two cast into the lake of fire are the, 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 the beast and the false prophet. That's the miraculously defeated. There's the end of seals. There's mid trumpets. There's the end of trumpets. Exactly as we've broken down. They think it's all connected to Jeremiah chapter 31 and, and this lineage. And they're trying to, dude, we've got it. It's fascinating. I've never come across this before. And brothers and sisters, we've understood it for a few years now. And now we find out that there's another inscription on stone tablets telling us the exact same thing. It's craziness. And I'm going to prove to you this evil king is the Antichrist. So now look at what happens in the Messianic tradition. Where was it? Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. And it says right here. So again, this is just earlier in the Messiah Ben Joseph piece. Um, talking about Messiah ben Joseph. Again, Messiah ben Joseph, just a reminder, is the Messiah ben Ephraim as well. Okay, the Joshua. If necessary, which it will, Messiah ben Joseph. Remember, we've shared on this a, a number of times that Messiah, some scholars and, and uh, rabbis, they don't believe Messiah ben Joseph will die in a battle. Some believe he will. Okay, some believe there was only one one uh, uh, teacher of righteousness that was and that there won't be another and it was about a previous time. They, So many of them don't realize was, is, is to come. Fulfilled in the is from the was and the was and the is both together reveal the is to come. And it's going to happen. It is all throughout scripture that we've been talking about. So if necessary, yes, it will happen. Messiah ben Joseph, listen to this, will wage war against the evil forces and die in combat with the enemies of God and Israel. We just showed where the connection was. He's going to die as the one of the two witnesses, which is what we're told that he is with Zerubbabel at the, in Zechariah chapter 6 which means he is one of the two witnesses during the time of trumpets, not the seals, guys, but during the time of trumpets, and we know war breaks out against them for two and a half years. And at the end of the war, they're killed, and their bodies are lying not properly buried in the streets, as it says, exactly as the prophecy of Gabriel said. And then it says, um, <clears throat> you see, they will say things, this is what I was telling you guys earlier. So this, I think, rabbi also commented on the Messiah ben Joseph's rebuilding of the temple. Well, I've shown to you and can prove right from Scripture this shouldn't be such a contradictory of things. It is not Messiah ben Joseph who rebuilds the temple. He is the high priest and king. It's Zerubbabel who does it. So then what we have here is in the Sefer Zerubbabel and later writings talking about the great calamities, calamities that will befall after that. So listen to this. In the Sefer Zerubbabel and later writings, after his death, huh, after his death, a period of great calamities will befall Israel. Remember, this is now the final year, the 14th year. God will then resurrect the dead. Hello. Remember that? The first who will rise from the dead. And usher in the messianic era of universal peace. The millennial reign is going to begin. Messiah ben David. There's now Messiah ben David's back. Will reign as a Jewish king during the period when God will resurrect the dead. And the ascendancy of, and that's the priests and righteous, will not largely be subject to messianic speculation. So see, now all of a sudden you've got your messiah, uh, messiah ben David now showing up. Who will reign as king during the millennial reign. That's what I'm saying. So when you, when you see this, we know Messiah ben Joseph is going to die. And when he dies, when he returns, coming down, feet down on the Mount of Olives, he's not coming back anymore as Messiah ben Joseph. He's coming back as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. 
full circle from east to east played out from the beginning of the 50 days to the end of 13 and then the 14th year being played out when he destroys all the enemies and then the millennial reign. Now watch this. What if we go to uh, the Sefer Zerubbabel? And the reason I want to go to this is I want to show you this in this final little piece as I bring it to the end. These pieces I was talking to you about just a little while ago. Sefer Zerubbabel, also called the Book of Zerubbabel, or the Apocalypse of Zerubbabel, is a medieval Hebrew apocalypse written at the beginning of the 7th century in the style of, uh, of biblical visions like Daniel's and Ezekiel, placed into the mouth of Zerubbabel. It narrates the struggles between Armalus. Who is Armalus? Armalus, brothers and sisters, the one I was telling you, is the Antichrist. You see that? Armalus is the anti-Messiah figure. So they're going to relate this in part to something that already happened, but we know it's the actual is to come because these guys, like I said, they always get caught up in, in things that happened not being this prophetic picture of still the future events in the actual end of days. So listen what it says. It narrates the struggles between the Antichrist and the Messiah. Listen to this. And the Messiah who is Ben Ephraim Ben Joseph. <laughs> Told you. He will precede um, this one here, Messiah Ben Emil, identified as the future Messiah Ben David. Remember? Messiah ben Joseph shows up first, who is the Messiah. When he shows up first, he's going to what? He's going to battle the Antichrist and the Ten Kings. It's the Ezekiel 39 war, and I'm going to prove it to you. And he comes, and what does he do? He's going to be the one who gathers as the Messiah ben Joseph, the Ephraim, the, the Jesus from second, uh, uh, Zerubbabel, uh, sorry, uh, uh, second Ezra's. Gathering the ten tribes, the great multitude rapture. And it says that he's going to precede the Messiah Ben David. Well, the Messiah Ben David, the anointed one, who is the Zerubbabel, is, of course, the one that will proceed after Jesus is revealed as, as well, not revealed, but as Messiah Ben Joseph, the seventh year of seals. Then we know, as we shared earlier, what the Messiah Ben David, who is the branch, who is Zerubbabel, will then bring in or help bring in Judah. Now listen to this. Amaryllis, that's the Antichrist, right? Antichrist is thought to be the cryptograph of this one. Okay? And the events described in Sefer Zerubbabel coincide with the Jewish revolt against Heraclius. Okay? They're, they're still tying it to things that happened in the past. This is the prophetic revelation. The actual Antichrist of the is to come. Listen to what it says next. The Sefer Zerubbabel mentions Gog, Gog and the Antichrist, rather than Gog and Magog as the enemies. Do you want to know why? Do you want to know why? You've already understood it. What do we know happens at the end of seals? What happens at the end of the sixth year of seals? It's the Ezekiel 39 war. Right? It's the Ezekiel 39 war. The Ezekiel 39 war, is it the, is it the Gog and Magog war? No. It's not the Gog and Magog war. It's the Gog and Antichrist war. It's the Gog and Antichrist war. All we got to do is go read it. Check this out. Some of you guys already know this because I've seen messages over over the you know few months ago, and many of you guys have caught this. We've known this for a while too, right? I am against the Ogog. Okay, Ogog. I am against Gog. This is Gog in Ezekiel thirty nine. It's Gog. In the land of Magog. It's not Gog and Magog. Okay? I will send fire on Magog, on the land of it. And then what happens? 
He's going to burn, you know, the weapons for seven years, something we've shared on, right, in the teaching. At the end of the sixth year, the Gog, Mag uh, the Gog battle, look, it, it's even here. The wrath of the Lamb, Antichrist killed, Gog, the land of Magog, okay? Gog is killed, the Antichrist is killed with Gog. And then what do they do? Then they'll be burning weapons for the seven years, which is the seventh year of seals, and six years of trumpets until they beat them back into swords again. Because they will have what? Been burning them and turning them from spears into, into plowshares for seven years. And so at the end of this Gog defeat and bury Gog in the Valley of Hamgog, then what happens? Seven months shall the house of Israel be burying them. Do you see how it all ties together? Who is the house of Israel? The great multitude rapture, the ten tribes, and they're going to be bearing them for seven months after that battle of the Ezekiel 39, which is the Revelation 17 battle, when the Antichrist in the Gog battle are defeated with the ten kings, the ten horns. Do you see how clear it is? Because what do we know? In that battle, the beast is killed. And Gog, those, those ten nations with him, those ten kings. Remember what it said? The beast that saw that thou sawest was, that's the second half of seals, and is not because he was killed, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. It's He was defeated at the end of seals. And he was defeated just in the exact same sword fight, the, the war that we were talking about here. When the ten kings give their power unto the beast, and then the Lord will make war, they will make war against the lamb, and the lamb will overcome them. That's why uh, Daniel chapter 7, the beast is killed. He is not. It's, it's precisely what it's talking about. It's, it's this battle of the first one that we talked about which is right here in gabriel's revelation which is the messianic figure from ephraim who breaks evil before righteousness can begin this is what this one's talking about here of amaryllis which is the antichrist and gog it's not the gog and magog one this is the one for the end of seals with the Antichrist with Gog. And then we see that after he defeats them, there's something else later that happens when now the leader of Messiah Ben Joseph, Ephraim, is killed because the evil king has somehow come back. Because he was, and then he is not because he's killed by Messiah Ben Ephraim in the war, in the Ezekiel 39 war. Then at mid trumpets, he shall be, and he's the evil one is going to kill the king who is the leader of Israel, which just reminded me of something. Check this out. We've got it in our book. We've got it in the book. When the seven churches play out again in the end of days, there's the beginning of the 50 days. Uh, there's the after the wedding, there's the 40 days that begin, the remnant workers. This is the start of the 50, and then the 14, they will be the workers here during seals. This is when Antichrist comes on the scene. Here's when they fled into the wilderness. So they flee at the wilderness at the mark of the beast when Antichrist gets his power in mid-seals to continue 42 months. And then this is till the end of the six years of seals. And who shows up? Time for church reformation. Who is the church reformation? It's a picture of what? Israel's kings. When Israel's kings show up on the scene, and then you've got Philadelphia, time of trumpets, the first half of trumpets, the 144 going out until what? The period of Israel's kings and their removal. What did it say? A leader of Israel who is killed. Now the king of Israel, Jesus, the Messiah, Ben Joseph Ephraim, is killed at mid trumpets and not, or, or sorry, is cut off at mid trumpets. The war breaks out for two and a half years. <clears throat> and the evil king, who is the Antichrist one, 
now defeats them and he's not properly buried. Yet somehow, at the end of it all, the evil king is defeated. So here he is. This is when he's defeated at the end of seals. Yet we know he's going to come back and he's going to defeat the Messiah Ben Joseph who will not then properly have been buried because he's one of the two witnesses lying in the streets. And then there's still what? The Gog and Magog. Let me prove it to you. And I'll bring this to an end before my throat just jumps out of me, ripping it up because it's so fascinating. Here is the end. This is the final 14th year. The resurrection of those who put their necks on the line. Those who are the Smyrna, the remnant workers. Those who will be part of the resurrection just as we were talking about. That it even spoke about. At the end, they're going to rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. And what happens? When the thousand years are over, verse, Revelation chapter 20, verse 8. Um, and they shall go out to deceive. Actually, no. We need to go back one more. Because what we see happen is the second battle. So this is the end of 13 years. The Messiah ben Joseph has been killed. And then what does it say? Then mysteriously, the, the evil one is now killed. This is when he's killed right here. And it said that uh, does judge and make war. So this is Yeshua coming. His vestiture dipped in blood. And it says on his sword, a sharp sword, that he should smite the nations. And what does he do? We come down here in Revelation 19, 19 and 20. It says, and I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army and the beast, right? The beast, that, that's the evil one, was taken and with him the false prophet that brought miracles before him to deceive them that received the mark of the beast. Both of these were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. That is the answer of, uh, where was it? Of, oh, it was back here. It was the answer to the one in Gabriel's. So the end of seals, Ezekiel 39, then he is not. And then Jesus is the leader, Messiah ben Joseph. Then he gets killed because the evil king comes back. And by the time the war is over, he's killed at the end of the sixth year of trumpets or the end of 13 years of tribulation, not properly buried. And then suddenly, the evil king is mysteriously defeated. Exactly. Because the Lord is now returning feet down as Messiah ben Joseph, just as it said he went, or sorry, Messiah ben David, he went from Messiah ben Joseph getting killed in the war and now returning as the lion of the tribe of Judah, Messiah ben David. And what does he do? He throws the beast, the false prophet, the first two into the lake of fire. There's your evil one mysteriously disappeared. And when we go back to the Sefer Zerubbabel, we saw that this one is the one at the end of seals. And you're noticing that when you see people in prophecy talk about the church prophecy, they always mix Ezekiel, or often mix uh, Ezekiel 39 and the Gog-Magog war of the end of the thousand years. They're not the same. One is Gog in the land, and the other one is Gog and Magog. And we could see here, there's the clear distinction. This is the one when he's defeated at the end of seals, and this is the one when Satan and all of his army is defeated at the end of trumpets. So the beast and the false prophet, they are gone. They are done at the end, of, or in the 14th year. They are toast. But it is Satan who was bound for a thousand years, that when the thousand years are done, he'll go out to deceive the nations, which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. These are not the good sand of the sea. Those are the enemies of the nations that are as the sand of the sea. And this one here, God will just breathe on them, fire, and they are toast. And then Satan will be cast into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet already are. Isn't that crazy? It's in ancient writings. 
Have you ever heard of Gabriel's Revelation? Ancient stone tablets written in ink called Gabriel's Revelation? It reveals exactly what we have taught. These things we have shown, these things we have broken down. It is insanity. This, this is the type of stuff that just makes my head explode. Putting all of this together from, from, from seeing the sand of the sea. So thank you, uh, uh, Roy, for, for sending me that a, a few months ago. It's insanity. I, di I didn't even realize all this stuff till this afternoon as I was digging further. And it just, like I said, well, we're going down this trail to, to mid-tribulation, to the great multitude rapture, but we're going to keep going to the end. And, you know, there are a couple diversions of, of things we would break off into along the way and then get back on track to take us right to the end. Why does this happen to Messiah? You see, why is Messiah going to do this again? He told us he will. Well, you have to understand, and our brother um, uh, Jimmy reminded us with this post again in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. In verse 4, it said, And did all drink the same spiritual drink? For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Remember when they were in the wilderness? And we talked about the rock and how God told them, called, told Moses that they were to speak to the rock that was following them, that was with them in the wilderness. They were to, he was to speak to the rock. And what does he do? Aaron, Moses and Aaron instead gather them together before the rock who is Christ. And call them all rebels and say, must we fetch this rock? They get this prideful and arrogance built up in them. Like, oh my goodness. But imagine all of these things that Moses had been doing. He parted the sea and brought them out and did all of these things. And these people kept rebelling. And kept rebelling. Until finally, Moses had, had enough and it's kind of gone to his head a bit. And it says, and Moses lifted his hand and with his rod, smote the rock twice. He struck the rock twice. One represented for Moses, which is for the people of Israel, which is Jesus who died already, already taking that strike, which was the lamb, which was the, the second sacrifice in Leviticus chapter one. If you go in reverse, the two turtle doves of Jesus's birth, the lamb, which represented the strike for Moses, which was the sins of the world for all of Israel, right? And for the world, the Gentiles grafted in. But there's another strike that was caused by Aaron because it was them together. And this is the purpose for the second strike that Christ knows he must do again because there is a priestly line portion who remember, remember how this all equals. These are the 12 tribes. The father told us that the priestly line are his. They have no part in the land because the tribe, uh, the, the priests belong to the father. So if these ones were already all saved, but the priests were not, and you end up, you understand what Leviticus is telling you. And you understand that there were two strikes. Well, if the turtle doves is a representation and two young turtle doves for Jesus at his birth, then Jesus being the sacrificial lamb without blemish, we have one left who is what? The atonement for the priestly line for Aaron and his sons represented as the bull. And who is the bull? Messiah ben Joseph Ephraim, when he comes, who is going to be what? Going to be there with the 144 overseeing while the other one is, the other anointed one is rebuilding the temple until the pit is open and war breaks out against the evil one, the Antichrist, until what? The ox, Messiah ben Joseph, Messiah ben Ephraim, ox is killed. 
because he will be the sacrificing atonement for the priestly line who has not yet been atoned for. Let that soak in. I Man, oh man, oh man, this was crazy. Look at this. It's 1230. It's, it's past midnight. If my neighbors are awake, oh my goodness, like I said earlier, thank goodness it's a holiday. I thought this was only going to be about two and a half hours until I just, man, man, oh man, oh man. What more evidence do you need? He is the rock that was following them. Do you know that if you go seek the, the other rock, when he when Moses actually spoke to it the first time? See, the first time Moses did speak to the rock, the definition of that rock wasn't even the same rock. Because the rock that's getting struck is the representation of Messiah, the one following them. <laughs> it's so bananas. Oh, my goodness. Brothers and sisters, I am going to leave you with that. Oh, my goodness. I Take your time. Watch it. Study it. Pray over it. Seek it. Search it. Track it back into the details of the revelation of the detailed tribulation timeline. The entirety of that story is detailed in the timeline. None of these things are new to us. That's what's so crazy fantastic. They're just more depth of detail of things we had already understood. Now just coming into greater and greater and greater light. Fantastic, crazy stuff. Brothers and sisters, I love you. I pray for you always. God bless you. God bless your families. We'll talk to you soon. Bye for now.